are Christians required to keep the Sabbath? That is a question that a lot of people are asking, and I had the honor of participating in a formal debate on that question. It was a lot of fun. Uh, my opponent was Christian author R.L. Solberg, who took the negative position that Christians are not required to keep the Sabbath, and I, of course, took the affirmative position that Christians are required to keep the Sabbath. And so this debate, it was hosted by Faith Unaltered. I definitely recommend checking them out. I'll uh, leave a, a link to their channel below. Um, and also, just a shameless plug, but if you are interested in more information on this topic from a pronomian, that is a pro-law perspective, I want to invite you to check out my book, Remember the Sabbath. Um, you can get that book at sabbathbook.com, and I'll leave a link in the description. And it covers many of the points that were brought up in this debate and much more. But with that, I hope you guys enjoy the debate. Hello and welcome to the pre-launch promotional debate. I'm your host, David Russell, here with my co-host, Tyler Fowler, and you have entered Faith Unaltered. Um, Tyler, how you doing, man? Good, good. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to get these two guys together to go over the Sabbath, this issue that has been really a trending, I think, kind of an issue over on TikTok, over on Facebook, YouTube, all the different social media platforms. And I'm just excited to be here with these two awesome guys. We've had Rob on before to discuss with Raymond Hopes. And then Raymond actually got me in touch with David. And so that's how this whole thing kind of came around. And I'm just, I'm super pumped to have you guys here. So thank you guys for joining us. And I'm just ready to rock and roll. It's great to be oh, with yeah. you guys. Yeah, we yeah, are going to rock happy. and roll. Yeah, we are going to rock and roll. Guys, we've got an amazing debate here tonight. Tyler, do you want to introduce our guest formally here before we get started? Absolutely. David Wilbur is an author, Bible teacher, and Christian apologist. He's authored several books, including his most recent work, Remember the Sabbath, What the New Testament Says About Sabbath Observance for Christians. David is a proponent of the pronomian that is pro-law theology. He is currently pursuing a degree in biblical studies with a a concentration in biblical languages. In addition to his books, David has written numerous theological articles for various newsletter publications and websites in which he has defended the pronomian perspective on the scriptures. Additionally, David serves as a researcher and a Bible teacher for 119 Ministries. He has done research and script writing for the Inspiring uh, Philosophy Apologetics Ministry, and on occasion he serves as a teacher at his local church, Founded in Truth Fellowship. David lives in Lake Wiley, South Carolina, with his wife and two children. His articles and teachings can be found at davidwilber.com. So, David, we want to, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm excited to have you here, brother. Is there anything that you would like to add to that before I switch over to Rob? Or... I just want to say, uh, you know, thank you guys for having me. It is an absolute delight to uh, be able to have this conversation with Rob, and I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. All right. And without further ado, Rob Solberg, R.L. Solberg, is the author of two books, Tourism, Are Christians Required to Keep the Law of Moses? and Divergence, The Impact of Anti-Semitism on Early Christianity. Rob is also a leading Christian apologist against Torah-observant Christianity. He has been pursuing theology, apologetics, and philosophy formally and informally for more than two decades. He studied at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and has a master's degree in theological studies from Williamson College, where he is now an adjunct professor of theology and philosophy. He also studied biblical Hebrew at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Since the release of his two books, Rob has appeared on numerous podcasts and radio shows to discuss his books and the rise of movements within Christianity that are teaching a return to keeping the Torah. Rob has also recently launched a YouTube channel called Biblical Defending the Biblical Roots of Christianity, where he posts videos, teachings on these topics. Rob is based in Nashville, Tennessee, where he lives with his wife of 30 years, Deborah. They are stakeholders at the Church of the City, Spring Hill, Tennessee, and have two spectacular daughters who are out making their mark on the world. Rob, is there anything that you would like to add to what has just been said? I think you have a career in voiceovers, Tyler. That was <laughs> I appreciate that, brother. I appreciate now, now you know why I uh, had him read the openings. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, he'll be doing movie trailers. 
Right. So, right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. No, anyway. <laughs> uh, David, anything else? I would mention, though, uh, yeah, yeah. is that I apologize for my internet connection. I'm at a hotel right now. So uh, I switched over, and we'll see if this works any better. But if I'm if I'm choppy, that's why. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, and, and and thanks for having me on. I'm excited to, to, to dialogue with David and see where this goes. I feel like we're going to – or I'm, I feel like I'm going to learn a lot even just in doing this. So thank you for letting me be part of it. Absolutely. David, before we introduce the format of this debate, is there anything that you would like to add? No, I was just going to just tell you, yeah, why don't we uh, like get into the format here? Uh, but just before, just remember, guys, this is a pre-launch. So this is going to be what you get to see as we go on, you know, this type of content. We're going to put people together to talk about these issues, to talk about Jesus, to talk about uh, uh, belief versus non-belief, all sorts of stuff. So just stay stay tuned um so tyler if you want to i know we got 15 uh minute minute opening statements right yep, yep. so um you want to explain the rest of the format for the guests absolutely so david being the affirmative position historically will go first with his 15 minute opening statement followed up by rob with a 15 minute opening statement then we'll go back to our rebuttal section david will give a 10 minute rebuttal and then rob will follow that up with another 10 minute rebuttal after that we'll take a short a very short two minute break to promote our launch event faith and altered on may 13th and 14th after that we're going to get into everybody's favorite my favorite portion of the debate anyway it might not be everybody's but i love the cross exam so we're going to go do two 15 minute back and forth with cross exam uh we'll start david asking questions to rob for 15 minutes and then we'll give it back over to rob to ask david for uh to ask david questions for 15 minutes then we'll uh the two will give a five minute closing uh and then we'll go right into audience q a so we'll go ahead and announce whenever you guys can start putting in your questions in the chat and then we will uh yeah we'll just take it from there so yeah guys uh, also when you're doing the cross exam don't uh, you know we're not going to i don't want to hold to some real strict format on that either uh i want you guys to be able to explain what you, you know your answer you know so if you go a little bit longer that's fine but you, you know i mean try to tidy it up but if you're going to talk about something and you feel like that's the way you're feeling led to go in by all means, have your freedom. Have your freedom. All right. Great. Awesome. So, all right. We'll start with uh, uh, David. Would yeah. you like to start your opening statement? Let me grab my timer real quick, and then I'll just tell. Me. Yep. Just tell me when. I apologize. Sorry, yeah, I'm not no prepared. Problem. <laughs> uh, all right. You ready? I'll start the timer whenever you start talking, David. All right. Well, first, I would like to thank Tyler and David for moderating this debate. And I'd also like to thank Rob for the honor of discussing this topic with him. I highly respect Rob and I share his passion for the gospel. There are a lot of things that Rob and I actually agree on. Salvation by grace through faith and not by works. We agree on the deity of Christ and so forth. Also, we both agree that Christians are required to keep nine of the Ten Commandments. Our disagreement comes down to one of those Ten Commandments. Should Christians keep the Sabbath? Now, if the uh, topic of this debate was, does the Old Testament teach that we should keep the Sabbath? There would be no debate. Everyone agrees that God wanted us to keep the Sabbath in the Old Testament. God himself kept the Sabbath after he finished creation in Genesis 2, and Exodus 20 says that God was giving us an example to follow. We see in Jeremiah 17 and Ezekiel 20 that God judged his people for breaking the Sabbath. In Isaiah 56, even foreigners, that is Gentiles, are admonished to keep the Sabbath. In Isaiah 66, Isaiah anticipates that all mankind will keep the Sabbath in the new creation. So again, there's no question that God expected us to keep the Sabbath in the Old Testament. The question is, did this expectation change in the New Testament? My opponent says yes. He claims that once Jesus died, Christians no longer had to keep the Sabbath. My contention is that God still expects his people to keep the Ten Commandments, including the Fourth Commandment, the command to rest on the seventh day. To support my contention, I can refer to the teachings and practices of Jesus and the Apostles. So the question is this, did Jesus expect his followers to keep the Sabbath? The Bible is clear that he did. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus said not even to think that he came to abolish the law and the prophets.
prophets. Abolish is translated from the Greek word kataluo, which according to BDAG means to cause to be no longer in force. So to abolish the law and prophets essentially means to nullify them. In other words, Jesus did not come to nullify God's commandments in the Old Testament scriptures. The Sabbath is one of those commandments, thus he did not come to nullify the Sabbath. By the way, the same Greek word for abolish is used in first century Jewish writings like four Maccabees and Josephus in reference to Antiochus. If you've read the story of the Maccabees, you know that Antiochus tried to stop the Jews from keeping God's commandments like the Sabbath. Josephus and the author of four Maccabees write that Antiochus literally came to abolish, kataluo, the law. That is, he came to stop people from obeying the commandments of the law. So when Jesus was talking about abolishing the law, this story would have come to the minds of first century Jews. Unlike Antiochus, Jesus did not come to do away with God's commandments. He came to fulfill the law and prophets. So in Matthew 5, Jesus affirms that the law should still be kept, which means that the Sabbath should still be kept. As scholar Dr. Carmen Imes puts it, quote, Jesus does not do away with the Old Testament law. He calls people back to it and he holds them to it, end quote. My opponent's position is that Jesus did do away with the law, but that is what Antiochus came to do, not what Jesus said he came to do. Nevertheless, Rob has argued, quote, Yeshua's sacrifice on the cross fulfilled what the Torah was pointing toward, and therefore he says, quote, we are no longer bound by the legal requirements of the law of Moses, end quote. While my opponent's view is popular, New Testament scholars widely reject it. Dr. Craig Keener says this interpretation of Matthew 5, quote, violates the whole thrust of the passage. Dr. J. Andrew Overman calls this interpretation hermeneutical gymnastics, and he says, quote, this passage is unambiguous and does indeed command obedience to the whole Torah. When you examine the rest of the passage, you can see why scholars say this. In the very next verse, Jesus says that not an iota or dot would pass away from the law until heaven and earth pass away and all is accomplished, that is, until the end of the age. My opponent takes the second clause, until all is accomplished, to be a reference to Jesus's completed work on the cross. So according to him, the law has already passed away. However, that interpretation is impossible because as New Testament scholar Donald Hagner points out, it would quote, contradict the meaning of the first clause, which refers to the ongoing validity of the law until the end of the age, end quote. In other words, heaven and earth are still here, so all cannot have been accomplished yet. So if Jesus did not come to do away with the law, then what does he mean when he says he came to fulfill the law? Well, according to BDAG lexicon, fulfill Plerau in this context most likely means, quote, bring to full expression, show it forth in its true meaning. In other words, Jesus fulfilled the law by teaching and demonstrating how to keep the law properly. And con the context of Matthew 5 confirms this meaning. In verse 19, Jesus admonished his followers to do and teach even the least of the commandments. Moreover, the entire Sermon on the Mount is Jesus's commentary on the law of Moses. Jesus contrasts his correct interpretation of the law with the incorrect interpretation of the Pharisees. That is why in verse 20, Jesus said his followers must surpass the scribes and Pharisees in righteousness. We do that by following Jesus's teachings on how to keep the law. As Dr. Overman explains, quote, Matthew's community understands, teaches, and does the law. This is the fulfillment of the law and the righteousness which surpasses that of the Matthean antagonists. If you not only teach the law, but do it, applying the dominant principles of love and compassion, you have fulfilled the law, end quote. Rob's position is that when Jesus fulfilled the law, he did away with it. But a better interpretation is that Jesus fulfilled the law by showing us how to keep it properly. Thus, in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, Jesus affirms the Sabbath commandment by stating that he came to teach us how to keep it properly. Jesus said the law remains valid until the end of the age, and Jesus said to keep even the least of the commandments. In line with this framework, a little later in Matthew, Jesus specifically teaches us how to keep the Sabbath properly. In Matthew 12, the Pharisees accused Jesus Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath. Jesus defended his disciples and said they were innocent of the Pharisees' charges. Moreover, Jesus declared himself the Lord of the Sabbath. What does Lord of the Sabbath mean? Well, according to scholar I. Howard Marshall, uh, he writes, quote, surely the point of the saying is that here Jesus claims an authority tantamount to that of God with respect to the interpretation of the law, end quote. So Jesus says his disciples did not break the Sabbath and declares himself the rightful interpreter of the commandment. 
If Jesus were doing away with the Sabbath for Christians, we would expect him to have said, it does not matter that they are breaking the Sabbath. Once I die, they won't have to keep it anyway. But he didn't. He said his disciples did not break the Sabbath and said he has the, the authority to determine true Sabbath observance. Remember, Jesus taught that our righteousness with, with regard to the law must surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus constantly criticized the Pharisees for their false teachings and for making God's commandments void through their traditions. Like Isaiah and Jeremiah, Jesus spoke against the bad doctrines from the religious leaders of his day and called for a return to proper Sabbath observance in accordance with God's law. In Mark's account, Jesus used this confrontation with the Pharisees to, to explain how God wanted the Sabbath to be kept from the beginning. He said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Numerous scholars recognize this statement as teaching the universal and permanent nature of the Sabbath. God created the Sabbath in the beginning for all mankind. Dr. Roy Gain writes, quote, Christ does not obligate, obligate the Sabbath commandment, but establishes its permanent validity by appealing to its original creation when God determined its intended function for the well-being of mankind, end quote. So Jesus emphasized God's purpose for the Sabbath, which was to bless mankind with the day of rest. Why would Jesus emphasize the true purpose of the Sabbath day if his intention was to get rid of it? That doesn't make much sense. On the other hand, Jesus teaching on the Sabbath's original purpose is precisely what we would expect if he wanted his followers to keep it. This expectation that Jesus' followers would keep the Sabbath shows up again in Matthew 24, 20. Jesus admonished his followers to pray that they would not have to flee on the Sabbath during the coming tribulation. Scholar Craig Evans says, quote, by having uh, Jesus urge his disciples to pray that the day of emergency not occur on a Sabbath, Jesus is once again seen as upholding the law, end quote. Again, if Jesus came to get rid of the Sabbath, why is he expressing concern over his followers' ability to observe the Sabbath in the future? If he did not expect them to be keeping the Sabbath, then he would not have said such a thing. And yet he does. Jesus says many things about the law and the Sabbath that are entirely inconsistent with Rob's position. So, Jesus' teachings uphold the view that we should keep the Sabbath. But what about the apostles? Did they agree that we should keep the Sabbath? The New Testament uh, indicates that they did. In Acts 13, 16, 17, and 18, we see that the apostles continued to faithfully keep the Sabbath. In Acts 15, 21, Acts 15, 21 assumes that even Gentile believers would be keeping the Sabbath as they attend synagogue services to learn from the Torah. As scholar F.F. F. Bruce writes for the Pharisaic party, quote, it was especially important that the whole Torah should be taught among the Gentiles. This, said James, was being attended to already in the synagogues, end quote. Some say that the early Christians kept the Sabbath merely out of tradition or to convert Jews. However, that view is ad hoc and widely rejected by New Testament scholars. A more natural interpretation for why the early Christians kept the Sabbath is quite simply because they believed they should. Again, this is not what we would expect if Jesus did away with the command to keep the Sabbath. By the way, the apostles' practice of keeping the Sabbath aligns with what we know from church history. While there were early Christians who did abandon the Sabbath, many of them did not. In fact, two 5th century church historians, Socrates Scholasticus and Sozomen, testify that almost all Christians outside of Rome and Alexandria still kept the Sabbath. Based on this testimony, uh, historian and scholar Kenneth Strand writes, quote, even as late as the 5th century, almost the entire Christian world observed both Saturday and Sunday for special religious services, end quote. Indeed, Christians continued to keep the Sabbath for centuries after the time of the apostles. Clearly, these Christians did not think Jesus got rid of it. Now, you might say, these early Christians were ignorant. Paul clearly taught in Colossians that the Sabbath is no longer important because it is a shadow that points to Christ. In Colossians 2.16, Paul did tell his readers not to let certain false teachers judge them with regard to the Sabbath. But we must recognize the context. According to verses 8 and 22, Paul was addressing human tradition and teachings. That description does not apply to the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a commandment of God, not a human teaching. So what's going on? Well, as scholars have recognized, Paul's problem was not with the Sabbath, but rather with the perversion of the Sabbath. These false teachers in Colossae had connected Sabbath 
observance with their worship of the elemental spirits of the universe, as we see in verse 8. As scholar Peter O'Brien writes, quote, Paul is not condemning the use of sacred days or seasons as such. It is the wrong motive involved when the observance of these days is bound up with the recognition of the elemental spirits, end quote. So a better interpretation of Colossians 2.16 is that Paul's readers must not accept judgment from these false teachers regarding how to keep the Sabbath. Why? Because they were keeping the Sabbath in a way designed to appease the elemental spirits, which is something that God never wanted. In the same way that Jesus opposed the Pharisees' misuse of the Sabbath, Paul opposed these false teachers' misuse of the Sabbath. Paul reminds his readers that the Sabbath is meant to reveal the work of Christ, not to be used to worship angels. The author of Hebrews, by the way, also talks about how the Sabbath points to Christ. It's a symbol of the ultimate rest we have in him. Now, some argue that since we now have rest in Christ, that means that literal Sabbath observance is no longer necessary. However, that conclusion is a non sequitur. Paul teaches that our earthly marriages are a symbol of Christ's relationship with the church, but nobody believes that Paul's teaching on the deeper meaning of marriage did away with the literal marriage institution. Likewise, there is no reason to think that the deeper meaning of the Sabbath does away with the literal commandment. But isn't the Sabbath part of the Old Covenant and now we're in the New Covenant? Actually, the Sabbath was made for all mankind in creation long before any Old Covenant. Also, the New Covenant includes the Sabbath. Jeremiah prophesied that God would write his law on our hearts in the New Covenant. As we see in Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah's concept of law includes the Sabbath. New Testament scholar Matthew Thiessen writes, quote, we have no evidence that Jeremiah thought that such a New Covenant entailed the obsolescence of ritual and cultic laws, or that other early Jews understood this passage to hint at such an obsolescence of the law, end quote. So again, the new covenant includes the command to keep the Sabbath. In Romans 8, Paul alludes to this new covenant prophecy when he says that Christians are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live out God's law. Unless you think Paul disagreed with Jeremiah, there is no reason to think that Paul excluded the Sabbath from God's law. But what about Romans 14, 5? Doesn't Paul say the Sabbath is just a matter of personal preference? Well, not according to the context. In verse 1, we learn that Paul is addressing disputable matters. It is unlikely that Paul thinks of the Sabbath, one of God's commandments, as a disputable matter. According to some scholars, a more accurate interpretation is that Paul is addressing traditional fast days. Dr. Charles Cranfield points out that this was the view generally held by ancient interpreters, such as Augustine and John Chrysostom. This view also fits the context. The next verse connects the observance of these days with whether one eats or abstains, that is, whether or not they fast. The Didache shows us that historically there were disputes among early Christians One minute, regarding... David. Thank you. The Didache shows us that historically there were disputes among early Christians regarding which days to fast. Thus, Paul does not say the Sabbath is a matter of personal preference. He is talking about disputable matters regarding fast days. In conclusion, the New Testament agrees with the Old Testament that God's people should keep the Sabbath. If Rob wants to convince us otherwise, he must address these passages where Jesus and the apostles affirm the Sabbath. He must explain why the apostles and much of the early church continued to keep the Sabbath into the 5th century AD, and then he must present a biblical case of his own to show that Christians are not to keep the Sabbath anymore. Thank you. Rob, uh, I'm delighted to have this discussion with you and uh, looking forward to the dialogue. Uh, you're awesome. All right. Well, All right. Uh, Mr. Solberg, you're up. All right. That I'll start your awesome timer now. Machine gun of arguments. That was great. Okay. <laughs> so makes me want to jump to the rebuttal, but I, let me just start with my opening statements <clears throat> and then we'll get into it. Um, so, and let me stay from the, from the outset here that my intention in this whole dialogue today is, is really to work together with David and, 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 and you guys, our hosts to, um, to really seek the truth of scripture and to glorify God's name, right? I'm not here to win an argument, so to speak, um, which I guess is probably bad protocol at the state at the front of the debate. But um, I just I just believe we can both learn from each other and that our ultimate authority, I think we both recognize is scripture. So if my position disagrees with scripture, I want to be corrected. And, and where it aligns with scripture, I say, let's affirm it together. So. Um, there's a few things. Let, let me, uh, I think in my opening arguments, I'll kind of clean up a few, I think maybe misspoken comments there about my position. So the question that was set forth by our distinguished hosts uh, is, are Christians required to keep the Sabbath? And so I'll just start out by saying that my answer to that question is a qualified no. Uh, 
Um, now, if we change the if we change the the question to should Christians keep a Sabbath, I think we would have a different a different discussion then, because I believe a weekly rest is a gift that God gave us, and it's a wise spiritual discipline that benefits followers of Christ greatly. It, it's an intentional act of placing our trust in God and acknowledging His importance in our lives, and so. I, I'm not against the Sabbath, and I don't oppose Christians keeping the Mosaic Sabbath. Um, matter of fact, I even have to admit I'm not the best at keeping my my day of rest myself. So, um, but the question before us really is: Are Christians required to keep Sabbath as a matter of obedience? So here again, um, I would offer a qualified no. And the reason I say the the question like that is I think David and I both agree salvation doesn't come from keeping the Sabbath. Um, mm -hmm. But so to dive into my position and explain it, let me first take a step back and, and talk about the story of the Sabbath in Scripture, and then we'll drill down on the specifics of Sabbath. So, so the story of Sabbath, the Bible opens, obviously, by describing the scene of darkness in, in creation, right? The Genesis 1-2 says the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the ancient Hebrews associated the sea with chaos, right? And the first chapter of the Bible reveals Yahweh speaking order into that chaos. And this happens over six days, and then God's creation work ends and, and culminates really on the seventh day of creation week, right? So Genesis 2-3 says, So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So, so the seventh day was unique. Right. God didn't go back to work on the eighth day. Right. His, his work was complete. And now God's presence filled his creation and the earth provided everything needed for his creatures. So on the seventh day of creation, um, it began with human beings, the only creature that was made in God's image, resting or sort of Sabbathing with God in the garden. And in Hebrew categories now, the number seven, Shiva, is associated with completeness or fullness. And that's exactly what we see in Eden. The seventh day of creation was was this true state of peace and contentment and, and rest, Shabbat, that we all yearn for, right? I mean, most of our life is spent striving to impose order on chaos. So we so we revel in those times where we experience joy and contentment. They're sort of a, a primal reminder that there's something better for us, right? This, that shalom and Shabbat, that that peace and rest is what we were built for. And it's this sense of, of Shabbat rest that, that the first humans enjoyed in Eden. And it was God's ideal for mankind. And then disastrously, as we all know the story, we disobeyed and we lost that rest. So Adam and Eve were then ejected from God's presence and went and sent into exile in the chaos of the wilderness again. And they had to work and toil now to survive. Now, because of that first sin, this same storyline of struggle has echoed in the life of every human being down through history. Our fundamental longing for completeness it's so powerful that it causes us to chase after it down these dark alleys of money and, and sex and fame and worldly success. We're all sort of striving for Eden. And the good news, of course, is that God is going to one day restore his Edenic vision of Sabbath rest and of creation. And we're given a prefiguring of that in the nation of Israel. So God rescued them from grueling slavery in Egypt, and he led them through chaos to the promised land, which he called my rest, by the way, in Psalm 95. Um, but even before the Israelites got there, God gave them a taste of their future rest through the gift of a weekly Shabbat, a, a day when they could just stop their working and striving and instead rest in God. And, and every seventh day, for an entire day, the Israelites could let go and just trust God for all their needs. And on top of the weekly Sabbath rest, every seventh year, the Israelites were to free their slaves, Exodus 21, to forgive the debt of their fellow Jews in Deuteronomy 15, and let the land rest in Exodus 23. And then there's the year of Jubilee, the Sabbath of Sabbaths. This is, this is Leviticus 25. This is where God commands Israel to count seven times seven years, so 49 years, and then sound the trumpet and consecrate the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, when they proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. Um, so the, all of these patterns of seven that we see in Scripture point to the hope of our ultimate restored rest with God. Now, unfortunately, after finally making it into the promised land, the Israelites abandoned God and they lost their rest. So the storyline repeats. Israel's exiled, tossed back into chaos, enslaved again, and so on. But Yahweh said that he would restore 
freedom and rest. And there was an ultimate jubilee to come. And then the Hebrew scriptures close and God's people haven't found that yet. And then one Sabbath day, early in the first century, a Jewish man named Yeshua Hanatsri, Jesus of Nazareth, stood up in a synagogue and he unveiled or unrolled the scroll of Isaiah and he read this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So this is from Luke 4, and Jesus is reading from what we know today as Isaiah 61. This was how Jesus began his earthly ministry on a Sabbath, proclaiming the year of Jubilee, the Sabbath of Sabbaths. So his Jewish audience would have immediately made that connection. He was declaring that God's ultimate Sabbath rest would come through him. And when we see this play out in his ministry, Jesus challenged chaos by casting out demons and and freeing people from sickness and disease and ultimately triumphing in victory over sin and death. So it's no coincidence that Jesus was crucified at the end of the week. His body rested in the grave, grave on Shabbat. And the next day, the eighth day, he was resurrected. Yeshua rose to, to, to new life on the first day of the week, inaugurating a new covenant and new creation. Once again, the life-giving light of God had pierced the chaos and the darkness. And because of the resurrection, we have an incorruptible hope in a future rest, an ultimate Shabbat. But we're not there yet. God's guiding us toward the promised land, but we're obviously still in the wilderness. We still experience tribulation and frustration and pain. Under the Sinai covenant, Israel was given a weekly Shabbat to foreshadow the rest that was to come. But under the new covenant, Christ is our Sabbath, our foretaste of God's ultimate rest in the world to come. In Matthew 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you Shabbat. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, so with that kind of backdrop of the story, Let's look at the specifics of the Sabbath in Scripture, many of which David uh, brought up and a lot of what he said I agree with. Um, I think here, though, I want to distinguish, uh, make a distinction here between the legal Sabbath requirements, which is the requirements of keeping the weekly Shabbat as given in the law of Moses, and the cosmic concept of, of Sabbath rest that we just looked at. So I view the legal Shabbat as a temporary expression or a picture or or as Paul calls it, a shadow of God's ultimate rest. So I'll I'll kind of get through this quickly here. If we jump back to Genesis, we see that for six days God created and then he set the seventh day apart as holy. But you'll notice in Genesis 2, 2 and 3, the Hebrew word word Shabbat there is used as as a verb to mean rest or cease. But the noun Shabbat, which refers to the weekly day of rest, isn't actually used until Exodus 16, when we see Israel fresh out of Egyptian slavery, wandering around in the desert, and God provides manna from heaven and commands Israel to collect a double portion on the sixth day so that on the seventh day, the Shabbat, they could rest. And I think we can all agree that those Sabbath commands weren't for all nations for all times. They they were given solely to Israel and were specific to the collection of manna. So those Sabbath commands don't apply today to Christians or even to Jews. But then Israel arrived at Sinai and God gave the legal Mosaic commands about the Sabbath as part of the law of Moses. It's the fourth of the Ten Commandments. Uh, In Exodus 20, the Sabbath is linked to the seven days of creation, but in Deuteronomy 5, it's linked to Israel's exodus from Egypt. So The weekly Sabbath is a decidedly Jewish institution, and it's the legal regulations of the weekly Shabbat that I believe Christians are not subject to because of the work of Christ. He didn't do away with it. He fulfilled it. So what are the terms of the legal Shabbat that I'm talking about? So obviously, as David made a fabulous point, the Torah, in fact, the whole Tanakh, takes the Sabbath very seriously. There's a strong prescriptive teaching about it, right? Israel was to work six days and rest on the seventh. So part of the Sabbath command includes six days of work each week. And Israel was to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy and do no work. And God's command to cease from work extended to the entire community, including servants and foreigners and even animals. The Sabbath was taken so seriously that the death penalties prescribed for desecrating it, which obviously we see carried out in Numbers 15. Now the Torah teaches that God gave Israel the Sabbath to set her apart from every other nation. In Exodus 31, 13, God tells Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you, between God and Israel. 
for the generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. And holy, of course, that word kadosh in Hebrew means set apart. So I believe the Sabbath is part of the holiness laws which were given to Israel to, to set her apart from all the nations around her. So in antiquity, if you came across a tribe of people who didn't work on the last day of the week and who avoided certain foods and whose males were all circumcised, you knew this was the Israelites. These were Yahweh's people. So in the Torah, we get this strong sense of how important Shabbat is and how it drove the national rhythm of Israel. And then we get to the New Testament and everything changes dramatically. The prescriptive teachings about the Sabbath, which were consistently repeated in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, are just nowhere to be found in the New Testament. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to argue from silence here. Because the New Testament does not mention the Mosaic regulation, I realize that does not necessarily mean they've ended. But as important and weighty as the weekly Shabbat is in the Hebrew scriptures, I think it should at least give us, uh, give us, uh, at least get our attention that the New Testament is silent about it. Now, the Sabbath is mentioned many times in the New Testament, but it's mentioned descriptively, not prescriptively. So we're told about things that happened on the Sabbath, but we're never commanded to remember the Sabbath or keep it holy. I mean, of all the things that Jesus taught during his earthly ministries, keeping the Sabbath was not one of them. We don't hear him say, uh, keep the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, do no work, none of that. In, in fact, in every passage in the New Testament where specific Mosaic laws are mentioned, do not murder, do not commit adultery, etc., the Sabbath is never included in the list. And when the Jerusalem Council gave ruling on what Gentile Christians ought to obey in Acts 15, David alluded to this, Sabbath isn't mentioned. What our Torah-keeping friends like David seem to miss, or at least I'll say under-emphasize, is that while Jewish religious leaders strove to build a fence of man-made rules around the Shabbat out of respect for the authority of Moses, Jesus holds far more authority than Moses. Moses was a, was a prophet and a mediator of God's law at Sinai. Jesus, by contrast, is our high priest of a better ministry and a better covenant, according to Hebrews 8. And he came to die for the sins of the world, not to reform temple Judaism. I mean, this is why he didn't hesitate to interrupt the temple sacrifices by overthrowing the tables of the money changers in Mark 15. And it was on Shabbat that Jesus said here in John 5, 17 and 18, my father is working until now and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus was working on the Sabbath. Well, how could that be? Well, as Jesus boldly announced, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. I mean, that's a title that can only belong to God. Jesus himself co-labored with the Father. One minute, the Rob. Copy that. During the six days of creation, rested with them on the seventh. And he's not only the Lord of the Sabbath, he's also the Lord of the Torah of Moses. So under mm -hmm. Jesus, it's not the one who keeps Shabbat who fulfills the law. Rather, Romans 13, 8, the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And Galatians 5, 14 says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But we're made complete by our faith in Jesus. And ironically, when our Torah-keeping friends advocate for a legalistic Sabbath observance, rather than honoring the commands of God, I, I feel like they're passively suggesting his, the ineffectiveness of his grace. So there's an eternal principle behind Shabbat, which was expressed differently under Moses than under Christ. The foundational principle of rest remains, but it's no longer expressed through ritualist, uh, ritualistic Sabbath keeping. Hebrews 4 says, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also, ent has also rested from his works as God did from his. Uh, so let me skip to the bottom here. All right, that's the time. <laughs> that's the time. All right. Okay. All right, uh, David, if you want to go ahead with your 10-minute rebuttal, sir, I will sure. start the timer when you start speaking. All right, real quick before that, uh, can you yep. hear me okay? I switched to my microphone. I realized I had it on my computer mic <laughs> for my <laughs> well, opening happens, statement. And so, yeah, no, it, sounds, it, does, it does sound more crisp now, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, good, bro. Well, now you're a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Rob, uh, I just want to say, I, I want to thank you again for this dialogue. And uh, I really appreciated so much of what you said and agree with much of what you said. You did a beautiful job of explaining the meaning of the Sabbath. Um, but I, I just want to reemphasize, like I mentioned in my opening statement, 
the deeper meaning does not negate the commandment. So you said you talk about how the Sabbath commandment um, was a temporary expression or symbol that it's expressed differently in uh I guess now that Jesus died and inaugurated the new covenant, it, it is expressed differently, but that's simply not what we see in the New Testament. In, in the New Testament, this, the expression of the Sabbath remains the same. It was remained a day of rest. It remained a day of um, worship and, and prayer, uh, as we see throughout the book of Acts. And uh, Jesus even, you know, he, he, Jesus was concerned about what was lawful to do on the Sabbath. He argued that his Sabbath healings were lawful, were in the, within the parameters of the commandment. So it doesn't seem like um like like what you're saying here uh is um lines up with the evidence of the new testament uh you talked about how jesus inaugurated a new covenant and of course i agree uh but we must note like i did in my opening statement that according to jeremiah 31 33 one of the new covenant promises is that god will write his law on our hearts now, um, you might say that the principle, uh, I, I guess you redefine what that means. I guess you redefine what law means in that passage to mean a, uh, a, a principle and, and not the actual laws, the, not the actual commandments. Um, but I, I just don't see that. I don't think that Jeremiah saw that either. I, I think you would have to prove from Jeremiah that that's what Jeremiah meant by his prophecy. Um, so, uh, Jeremiah says that uh, the new covenant will be different from the Sinai covenant, but he says that uh, his point there is not that the law would be different. He says, unlike the previous generation, members of the new covenant will be faithful to God's law because it will be written on their hearts. When you read the passage, nothing about a new law is there. We have every reason to think that Jeremiah's concept of law includes the Sabbath based on Jeremiah 17, when Jeremiah clearly admonishes God's people to keep the Sabbath. Here's a scholar from a Dr. Carmen Imes. She writes uh, regarding the new covenant. She says, quote, why do they need a new covenant? The reason is clear, not because there was something wrong with the Sinai covenant, simply because they broke my covenant. The problem was with the people. The covenant hasn't changed. It involves the same partners and the same law. Also, Dr. Matthew Thiessen, he's a, not the lead singer of Reliant K, but he's a New Testament scholar. He writes, quote, We have no evidence that Jeremiah thought that such a New, Testament, a new Covenant entailed the obsolescence of ritual and cultic laws, or that other early Jews understood this passage to hint at such an obsolescence of the law, end quote. So, I, I mean, it, it seems like Scripture is clear. I'm not seeing... It, the, what you're saying from scripture, uh, other New Testament scholars uh, apparently don't see it either. You say that the Sabbath was a decidedly Jewish institution, but that's simply not the case. The Sabbath was given to Gentiles. Gentiles are admonished to keep the Sabbath in Isaiah 56. Um, also in Acts 15, What's, what's interesting about Acts 15 is that it actually assumes that Gentile believers would be attending synagogue services on the Sabbath. After James gives his ruling, he states in verse 21 that Moses is proclaimed every Sabbath in the synagogues. Like I uh, said in my opening statement, according to F.F. F. Bruce, quote, this observation was perhaps intended to calm the apprehensions of the Pharisaic party in the Jerusalem church, in whose eyes it was especially important that the whole Torah should be taught among the Gentiles. This, said James, was being attended to already in the synagogues. Also, uh, Ajith Fernando uh, likewise writes, quote, James' concluding point in verse 21 was probably made to reassure the Christians who had come from the Pharisees and who wanted to see the Torah taught among the Gentiles. He says that this was happening in the synagogues in every city each Sabbath, end quote. So um, it, it seems like the Sabbath is assumed to continue to be kept as it is given in the law, uh, even with Gentiles. So um, uh, I, I really like what this uh, New Testament scholar William Willimon writes in his Acts commentary. He writes, James seems to regard these Gentiles as analogous to strangers in the Hebrew scriptures. Even Gentiles are to keep that part of the Torah, which applies to them as non-Jews, end quote. Uh, now we can uh, have a debate about what laws applied to the Gentiles as non-Jews, uh, what parts of the Torah they should keep. But I think it's really clear in Exodus 20 and elsewhere, Isaiah 56, that the Sabbath applies to the stranger, the Gentile, just as it applies to the native Israelite. Um, you said that the Sabbath was given to make Israel 
holy. Well, Christians are called to be holy. Peter reinforces the Sabbath when he tells his readers to be holy as God is holy. And Peter's concept of holy conduct is based on Leviticus, which he quotes in that passage in uh, 1 Peter um, 1. Uh, he quotes Leviticus 19.2, which says, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. The very next verse defines holy conduct as including the command to keep the Sabbath. So Peter, according to most scholars, was likely written to a Gentile audience, and yet he, com he uh, reiterates this command to be holy. And of course, Peter's definition of holiness is was based on the scriptures he quoted, which includes the Sabbath. You talked about how the Sabbath commandment was not repeated in the New Testament. Um, well, you, you say that, that it's not explicitly repeated, but a commandment, uh, as, as you already noted, a commandment does not need to be explicitly repeated to be reinforced. The commands against practicing necromancy, bestiality, and cross-dressing are not explicitly repeated in the New Testament either, but everyone agrees Christians should keep those commands. Your argument um, is actually the same flawed logic that progressive Christians use to say that the laws against homosexual behavior are done away with. Progressives say that Jesus had nothing to say about homosexuality. Now, while it is true that Jesus did not explicitly address homosexual behavior, this proves nothing, as I think you would admit. And as Dr. Michael Brown points out, Jesus did address this issue in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. He says, quote, when Jesus said he was not abolishing the law and prophets, but rather fulfilling them, he clearly intended that this prohibition would continue to stand as well, end quote. And as I argued in my opening statement, we can say the same thing about the Sabbath. It is reinforced by Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5, 17 through 20 and elsewhere. Jesus commands his followers to do and teach the commandments of the law in Matthew 5, 19, which obviously includes the Sabbath. Jesus also assumes the Sabbath's validity in his teachings on what is lawful to do on the Sabbath. He was concerned with what is lawful to do on the Sabbath. Frankly, we have actually more support in the New Testament for the ongoing validity of the Sabbath commandment than we do for the command against homosexual behavior, which we all agree, um, it, you know, it, it still applies. Peter, uh, like I mentioned, also reinforces the Sabbath when he calls Christians to be holy. Jeremiah clearly included the Sabbath as part of the law um, in Jeremiah 17. Uh, and he talks about how in the new covenant that this law will be written on our hearts. Paul reinforces the Sabbath in Romans 8 when he says that Christians are empowered by the Holy Spirit to keep the law in accordance with the new covenant promise. And of course, I think that Paul would agree with Jeremiah on what that new covenant promise entails. Uh, when it comes to what the law was. Uh, not only that, but all of the New Testament exhortations to keep the law or commandments certainly include the Sabbath. After all, for the New Testament authors, their scriptures were the Old Testament. And Paul writes that all scripture is profitable for training in righteousness, and specifically the Old Testament scriptures, as we read a verse earlier, because he talks about how he defines these scriptures as what Timothy learned from his childhood. You brought up John 5, 17 and said, well, Jesus worked on the Sabbath. But according to New Testament, scholar Craig Keener, quote, Jesus' argument supports rather than undermines the Sabbath, end quote. In other words, from Jesus' perspective, he is not undermining the Sabbath command, but merely challenging his opponent's interpretation of it. Jesus defends his Sabbath healing by stating, quote, my father is working until now and I am working. But we got to understand- One minute, David. Thank you. We got to understand that the working until now of the Father is explicitly defined, identified in John 4, 34, 6, 29, 9, 3, and 10, 37 as the works of salvation accomplished by the Father through the Son. It's not like works of creation, like God was doing the first six days of creation. It's the works of salvation. John defines what that means for us. To assume that Jesus' statement announces the end of the Sabbath is to hold the same view as Jesus opponents who accused him of breaking the Sabbath. But that is the very accusation that Jesus denied. Jesus never admits to breaking the Sabbath, but always defends his actions as perfectly in line with the commandment. Jesus essentially says that he is engaged in the same activity as the Father, which is perfectly lawful to do on the Sabbath. All right, Rob, you're up. I'll start your 10 minutes when you utter your first word. <laughs> Is that the book you're quoting from? Yes. I, I recognize that Carmen Imes quote. Okay, great book. I'm going through it right now. Um, 
Okay, so I guess it's started. Man, this is the thing I was worried about that we would have like all, all, all kinds of rabbit trails to go down. So let me start here. Let me start with a couple kind of larger clarifying things. Number one, I don't think Jesus ever undermined the Sabbath or taught against the Sabbath. I think Jesus lived his life in perfect obedience to the Sabbath and the rest of the law of Moses. Um, I don't think the Sabbath was ever prohibited or done away with or, uh, you know, I don't think nowhere in the New Testament are, is the Sabbath s said we can't we can't um, keep it anymore. So my position is that the Sabbath, like many of the other Mosaic commandments, is permitted but not required of Christians, meaning that if you especially now I've talked to many um, Jewish rabbis and, and Messianic Jewish believers in Jesus who still keep those things. And they understand and, and admit that part of their cultural DNA, they are the people of the covenant and they want to keep Shabbat and Passover and all that stuff. And that's great. I have no problem with that. I don't think, you know, if anyone says that I'm teaching that the Sabbath is done away with, that's they're misrepresenting me. Um, regarding Matthew 5, 17 through 20, um, and I'm not going to get into this in a whole lot of detail because I just put a video out on it so you can you guys can look at it. But I believe what that passage is saying, as I read it, as I study it, Jesus is saying, until all is fulfilled, nothing's going to change in the law. Um, and not until heaven and earth shall pass away. And here's why. Because we know that we don't make sacrifices anymore. Hebrews 10 tells us we do not make, there's no more sacrifice for sin now that Jesus has come. Sin sacrifices are required in the law of Moses. So if Jesus said not even a jot or tittle will change until heaven and earth pass away, he would have been lying to us because a jot and a tittle, not more than that, entire sacrificial laws, and I'm not going to say have been done away with, they were fulfilled in Jesus and are no longer required. Same thing with the kosher food laws. The kosher food laws are no longer required. Um, they're still an option if you want to eat kosher, great. But because there were changes that we can point to, we know that Jesus wasn't saying nothing in the law is going to change until heaven and earth pass away. Rather, what he was saying is until heaven and earth pass away, the following statement is true. Nothing in the law will change until all is fulfilled, all is accomplished. And in Luke 24, 44 through 48, Jesus is telling his disciples, remember what I told you back there in Matthew 5? All that stuff about nothing's going to go away till it's been accomplished. Well, you guys were my witnesses. I accomplished it. It's done. This was, this was the resurrected Jesus explaining that he had accomplished everything through his resurrection. So I would reject the idea that, that Matthew 5.17 automatically means that Sabbath is required for Christians post-resurrection and post-ascension. Um, you mentioned Matt, uh, Matthew 12 and a few other things. So the, the Sabbath was required obviously, as a, 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 an act of obedience under the law of Moses, up until the new covenant was inaugurated, which is at Christ's death. So everything he teaches pre-crucifixion, pre-resurrection, obviously shows that the law of Moses is, is in effect. Now, I, I also have to be clear, and I'll refer people to my YouTube channel for the deep, detailed stuff, but I don't believe the law of God changes ever. I believe there's a, an unchanging law of God that's expressed differently at different times. So the law of God and the requirement for rest of his people was expressed one way under Moses and a different way under Jesus, not because God changes, not because the law was his, his law of God is, isn't, isn't perfect. It's because his people change and because God moves in history and changes things for us. So when Jesus came, I mean, that's the most important event in human history. And it changed so much. It inaugurated the new covenant. Everything about the way God's people relate to him changed when Jesus came and, and, and fulfilled his commitment, lived the law perfectly. So I think when we have something like Colossians 2, 16 and 17, you, you mentioned that, you've got Paul saying, don't let anyone judge you about feasts or, or Sabbaths or new moons and all that, right? And then you said that, that Paul is just saying, don't let them judge how you keep those things. But, but the text just doesn't support that because the next read, the reason Paul gives for that in the next verse in verse 17 is because those things were a shadow that pointed to Christ. So why would he say, don't, don't let them judge how you do it because they're a shadow of things that, you know what I mean? It doesn't, that, that's a non sequitur there. It doesn't, it doesn't, the logic doesn't flow. What makes a lot more sense is Paul saying, look, you're permitted to keep those things, but not required. So don't let people judge you because they are 
a shadow of Christ and Christ has already come. And by the time he wrote the letter in Colossians, Christ had already come. So there's this idea of a change has happened because of the work of Christ. And I think we need to account for that. So if we have laws that God gave only to Israel, Exodus 19, one through six, God's making this covenant, making these laws only with the house of Jacob, which refers to the descendants, the physical descendants of Jacob, who's also called Israel. God is making that covenant just with them, not with the Gentiles, not with everybody else. Assyrians are not expected to keep the Sabbath. Egyptians are not required to keep Shabbat. Even Isaiah 56, which you mentioned, isn't talking about a rule for Gentiles. It's saying for those Gentiles who want to come in and associate themselves with the God of Israel, they can keep my Sabbaths. That's great. But but it's just kind of like saying the, the laws of France, right? So, hey, the laws of French are only for the French people. If you want to go live in France, you're going to have to live under those laws. But you can't say that the laws were given also to Germany and Poland and Brazil, right? So I think what we miss is this, is this very distinctly Jewish aspect of the law of Moses serving as the terms of the Sinai covenant. And now in the New Testament, we've got the people of God have the de definition of the people of God has totally changed. Back then, it was the house of Jacob and the people of Israel, right? So you've got the 12 tribes, you've got the physical ethnic descendants, and then whoever else God in his great mercy allows sojourners to travel with them. And they can even, you know, partake in things like the Passover if they get circumcised, so certain rules. But now in the New Testament, we're looking at a, this, the people of God having a new definition. No longer is there a Jew and a Gentile in, in, the, in the body of God, in the family of God, right? That distinction is gone. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no more Jewish things. Like, it's not about uniformity. We, there's still unity. But it's saying that in terms of being a member of God's family, being considered, as it says in Galatians 3, a descendant of Abraham, it's no longer an ethnic thing. It's no longer a genealogy. Now it's a matter of faith in Christ. If you believe in Christ, now you're in. You're in God's family. You're considered adopted or grafted in, as, as Paul says in Romans 11. So you become part of the people of God. And the people of God under the new covenant not only are defined differently, but Jesus brought a new expression of the commandments, the new expression of the law. So the law of Sabbath isn't done away with. It's just expressed differently through Christ. The law of sacrifices isn't done away with. We still have a sacrifice through Christ. He's our sacrifice. Same thing with the with all the other laws that we see in, in the Mosaic law. Um, the things that do carry over, and you mentioned some of these, David, are laws about right and wrong, laws about loving God, laws about loving other people. None of those have changed, but just specifically those Mos or those uh, what, what I call the holiness laws, the laws given to set Israel apart from the other nations. Those are what have changed, and that's because Israel. Is no longer set apart from the other nations. We're all one in Christ. Do I have more time? I have more. I have more notes. Oh, here I'll keep going until someone tells me to share. Yeah, you've yeah, got no, a few minutes. Good. Yep. Okay, Acts fifteen twenty one. Uh, you mentioned that several times. So in in Acts we have the Jerusalem Council, and they're saying, well. Do the, do the Gentiles need to keep the law of Moses? Do they need to be circumcised? What should we do about this? They all get together in Jerusalem. I know you know this whole story, David. I'm summarizing for our listeners. Um, they get together and talk about it and decide, no, here, here's four restrictions we're going to give the Gentiles. Uh, that didn't include Sabbath. It didn't include kosher food laws. It didn't include a lot of that stuff. Okay, so it included just four regulations. And then in 1521, as you mentioned, Paul says, or I'm sorry, James says, for from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So notice the past tense of that whole sentence. From ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, he is read every Sabbath in the synagogue. So there's, a, I guess there's a, a present tense. But the point here is that this isn't this isn't the uh, the church giving Gentiles four kind of starter pack of commandments, and later on they'll learn the whole Torah. There's nothing there's nothing in the New Testament that teaches that Gentiles ever should learn the whole Torah, or that they ever did learn the whole Torah. What, the, the meaning of of verse twenty one, I think, is far more accurately read as: Look, because Moses has been read every Sabbath in the synagogues, and you new Gentiles are coming into a Jewish movement. You're coming into the way. You're following Yeshua HaMashiach, right? The Jewish Messiah. Now you need to learn. We want to give you a few things to 
avoid offending your new Jewish brothers and sisters. So here's four things you can do, things that wouldn't have been obvious to them. It would have been obvious to them not to murder, not to commit adultery or steal. It wouldn't have been obvious not to eat meat from strangled animals. That's kind of a, it's a very Jewish thing. So the point of that verse is unity. In the, and we see that reflected in Romans 14, where Paul calls the weak in faith and the strong in faith. And his position to both is respect each other. We're all part of right. the same family. That's time. Time. All right. Welcome back, guys. We have uh, your 15-minute uh, cross exam time. Um, and we're starting with David. We're going to keep the... Um, you know, keep it the same. David, you go first. I'll start whenever you put your first question out. All right. One second here. I have a document called cross exam. So, <laughs> all right. It's all good, man. Take I have time. a feeling you're that organized. <laughs> all right. Um, Rob, uh, once again, man, it, it has just been an utter delight to, to discuss with you. I, I hope to have more dialogue on on this and other topics in the future. Would love to have you on my channel uh, someday and to talk about your upcoming debate with Tovia Singer, which I'm totally mm -hmm. jealous that you get to debate him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, just have a few questions for you. Um, does scripture, and, and I already kind of know your answer to this because you already said, but does scripture anywhere explicitly overturn the keeping of the weekly Sabbath or state that it has come to an end? No. Okay. I can't so, really elaborate on that. It's a pretty solid answer. Great. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what you say on, on page 48 of your book. So I, I knew that's what your answer was going to be. Um, and I knew so, you did more homework than me. <laughs> You're awesome. So, so the idea that the Sabbath is no longer required is, therefore, at best, only implied based on these other arguments you've made. Given that God explicitly and repeatedly commanded that the Sabbath be kept, if he wanted to say that it no longer needs to be kept, why would he not say so explicitly? Why would he only imply it? Good question. Um, I can't... Um... I can't, you know, purport to know the mind of God. I can answer your question perhaps with a question. If God explicitly wanted the Sabbath to be kept, why did he not expressly say that in the New Testament? What is the reason for the complete stark change in direction? Uh, well, I, I, I guess I just don't, see, I, I think the, this idea of a stark discontinuity is being over-exaggerated. Uh, like I've, I think I've made clear, the New Testament uh, reinforces the Sabbath in numerous ways. Um, okay, and, let me say you know, it this way. Yeah. I'll, I'll clarify my answer. The stark change that I'm talking about is there's nothing in the New Testament that says, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, do no work. There, uh, there's a stark change in the um, expression of the legal requirements of the Sabbath. That's what I'll say. I'm not, I'm not saying that the Sabbath isn't discussed or any of that, just that there's a stark change in the commandment, commandments related to the Sabbath. Okay. Well, I mean, couldn't a reasonable explanation be that there is no need to explicit for Jesus or the, you know, the apostles to explicitly command them, the, their readers and, and uh, hearers to keep the Sabbath since at least for Jesus, I mean, his audience was Jewish and they were already keeping the Sabbath. Yeah. So, so there really would be no need for them, for him to explicitly command uh, his, his followers to keep the Sabbath. So um, sure, I, I, mean, I guess, yeah. It makes sense that he would have an assumption they already know that. Right. Um, but he repeats a bunch of other commands they already know, too. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, et cetera, and on and on. So um, it's, it's an interesting, this isn't what I, this he, isn't he what doesn't, I he doesn't, to. he doesn't explicitly repeat the command uh, to not engage in homosexual behavior. Paul does. And I think Jesus does when he says avoid sexual immorality. Well, when he well, assumes, that's. Well, that's not that's not explicitly against homosexual behavior. Uh, sure. You have to you have to know what the Torah says to know what sexual immorality means. Granted, and, okay, and so point. so it's an in so it's an indirect affirmation. Yeah, that's a good um, point. And, yeah, yeah so we'll, we'll get to, we'll get to that in a little bit. I, I want to ask okay. one more more question really quick. Since you admit that Scripture nowhere explicitly does away with the Sabbath, mm 
aren't Christians reasonable to believe that we should still keep it based on Scripture's explicit commandments and implicit reaffirmations of the commandment? Is your question, are you asking me, is it reasonable for a, a Christian to believe that they should yeah. keep this? Yeah, just as a Christian, just reading the scriptures and seeing that it's explicitly commanded, that uh, it seems to be implicitly reinforced in the New Testament at, at the very least, and uh, that uh, you admit that there, the New Scripture nowhere explicitly does away with it. Aren't Christians who right. read the Bible uh, perfectly reasonable to believe that it still applies to them? Well, I guess that's a trick question, because if I say no, I'm telling you that I'm unreasonable. So I would say this. There is, I think it's reasonable to have an expectation of continuity between the Torah and the New Testament. That's reasonable. That's even reasonable as a default baseline. Hey, okay, if it doesn't great. Say it, let's just assume that there is a continuity. Great. But Perfect. Again, let, like let, with, let, let's, let's leave it there because I, I we'll, we'll get back to that a little bit more. Um, so uh, you already answered this, but should Christians in the New Covenant obey God's laws against homosexual behavior? Of course, we should obey Great. all of his laws. Okay, so homosexual behavior was prohibited in the law of Moses. So why should New Covenant believers continue to prohibit it? Because Paul wrote against it explicitly. Okay, well, couldn't we say the Sabbath is still in effect since it is also reaffirmed in the New uh, Testament? For example, Jesus taught us how to properly keep the Sabbath. So the Sabbath seems to be repeated and retaught by Jesus. The apostles also assume the Sabbath's validity in their teachings well, yeah. and practices. Okay, so I think I think that the you're you're overreaching a little bit respectfully in saying that it's retaught and repeated. The, the, the Mosaic commandments, and I, I was kind of specific about the legal Mosaic commandments, are not retaught or, re, or, or repeated. You're right, that, you're right that it is assumed in Jesus' teaching. He's clearing up. He's unwinding all those man-made regulations so the Sabbath can be what it was intended to be. And that does speak to the idea that the Sabbath was important. Jesus was Jewish. His followers were Jewish. The people he was teaching were Jewish. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law, he was fighting over the Sabbath about were Jewish. So all of that, that's like, it's like inside baseball, right? That's how I'm viewing this, that, that the laws of Moses were effective on the Jewish people and everyone there, I think disciples, Jesus, everybody knew that the Sabbath should be kept and that it was a law of God. And I will even add that it was enforced as the law of Moses and in effect up until the time Jesus died, until well, the blood I of the new... Read, I believe that the that the Sabbath of the Mosaic Covenant was still in effect on Jews. Okay, so uh, Jesus also said uh, he commanded his disciples to make disciples of all nations and to teach them everything that he commanded them. And so Jesus right. is teaching te Jesus's teachings obviously include at Matthew 5, where he uh, affirms the ongoing validity of the law, which includes the Sabbath, and also his teachings on what is lawful to do on the Sabbath. Uh, so mo moving on really quick here, though, um, I'm glad we agree on the Bible's laws against sexual immorality. Um, I have to be honest, uh, I'm a little concerned about the logical implications of your hermeneutic, and let me explain why, and then I want to give you a chance to clarify your views and, and perhaps uh, correct some of my misunderstandings about your views. Yeah. But you've uh, argued that Jesus's sacrifice fulfilled the law, so therefore, quote, we are no longer bound by the legal requirements of the law of Moses, end quote. This is the same argument that progressive Christians used to do away with the laws against sexual immorality. For instance, Matthew Vines, who is a Christian, quote unquote, mm -hmm. LGBT advocate, he writes, quote, once Christ fulfilled the law, his followers would have trivialized his sacrifice by living as though they were still subject to the law's constraints, end quote. So there seems to be a connection between antinomianism and progressive Christian theology. Matthew Vines, of course, does not interpret the New Testament as forbidding homosexual behavior, but he does consider the Old Testament to be clear on this issue. When we unhitch from God's law, our position against this heresy uh, is uh, drastically weakened, in my opinion. Can you see why Christians are concerned with the idea of unhitching from God's law? You remember the backlash against Andy Stanley and all of yeah. that. Uh, yeah. So can you can you see why we're concerned with this? Uh, some I of share, the I share your concern. 
Yeah, absolutely. I can see that. And I share your concern and I'm not antinomianism. And I, I, I do not want us to break away from the law of God. I don't think that's right. I think we are under the law of God and we always have been and we always will be. We're just not under the mosaic expression of that law. We're not under the national constitutional laws of Israel. That's all I'm saying. And regarding regarding the homosexuality, I, I totally agree with you, David. I actually did a whole article on uh, Matthew Vine's theology, looking at that. And one of the big distinctions, I think it's a very critical distinction in, in what you're talking about, is the fact that homosexual behavior is explicit, explicitly written against in the New Testament. The Sabbath is not, there's not, if, if the Sabbath was explicitly expressed in the New Testament, you and I wouldn't even be having a debate, right? So there's a huge difference there. When Matthew Vine says the law has been overturned, yet Paul is saying in a couple places that no, that's still considered sexual immorality, then sure. no, Paul reteaching that same law. But the, yeah, the and, law and, and right, and, and and obvious, obviously, I agree with you that Matthew Vines is misreading the New Testament. I think right. the New Test, I think the New Testament is clear as well. But uh, I'm, my concern, and I think the concern of a lot of Christians, is that uh, our position is weakened when when we start going down this road of saying the legal requirements of God's law, um, you know, are uh, you know done away with after Christ. So That's one one one, one more quick question for clarification no, I, there. Well, I think this is important though. We I don't I don't want to be labeled as someone that's teaching that something's done away with and abolished and all that. What I'm saying is that it's fulfilled. There still is a law of sacrifice. It didn't go away, but it was you say you Jesus. said, quote, we are no longer bound by the legal requirements of the law of Moses. Right. But we are bound by the law of God. The law of Moses is a different thing to me. It's a it's a it's a subset. How, it was given only to is, Israel. Is there is there any lexical evidence that backs that up? Because according to okay. the uh, according to the entire Old Testament, the Apocrypha, Josephus's writings, over and over again, God's law in Greek is uh, equated with the law of Moses. So uh, it seems like uh, you're you're kind of redefining what God's law is. Uh, yeah, fair enough. I mean, I see I see what you're saying. If you're not familiar with my principle and expression framework, that's an easy mistake to make, and that's on me actually for not being more clear about that. I, I mean, it just so, it just I, seems ad it just seems ad hoc to me. Like it, right. it seems like a convenient yeah, no, way. Yeah. So when I say the law of God, I'm not. That's a phrase that I use to talk about the unchanging, unchanging principles that are grounded in God that never change. Now, and I've said this before and I haven't said it here yet, my terminology of law of God doesn't necessarily match with every time that phrase is used in scripture. It, we've got to okay. we've got to we've got to see every time that's used, we have to look at it in its own context. But when I'm talking about the law of God, I'm talking about the unchanging and here's a good example. You've got the the let's say the kosher food laws, right? So in Genesis 9:3 Noah is told, you can eat every living thing that exists in the world, okay? Every moving thing is yours for food. Then in, in Leviticus 11, God says, nope, all these things are now forbidden, mm -hmm. okay? So mm -hmm. something changed, and something changed dramatically because Noah could have a, a, a pork barbecue sandwich if he wanted. So what changed? I think we would both agree it's not God. Right. Okay. And it's not the law of God, but something has changed between those two things. Well, and then well, when the yeah. changes, in the New Testament, it changes again. So all right, all right. You... I got it. I got it. So um, obviously, I, you know, the Genesis nine is beyond the scope of this debate. We'll have to agree to disagree there. I think Noah, uh, you know, he was already distinguishing between clean and unclean animals in chapter. Well, that, seven, was, that but... was when he put them on the ship. But once they got off the ship, God said, you can eat them all. All right. Uh, fair enough. Agree to disagree. In Isaiah 56, uh, God admonished Gentiles to keep the Sabbath and says that when they do, God will make them joyful in his house of prayer. Similarly, in, in Mark 2, 27, Jesus said the purpose of the Sabbath day from the beginning was to benefit mankind. Yeah. Do you believe the Sabbath day still benefits us or did that end at the cross? Does God still bring joy to people who keep the Sabbath today in the same way he brought joy to those Gentiles who kept it in Isaiah 56? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I said that in my in my opening statement. The, the, Great. The, yeah. So I do, I do believe that keeping the Sabbath is a wise, beautiful act of spiritual discipline and that it helps, grow, helps us grow closer to God. Uh, it shows that we're placing our trust in God. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah, like I said, if we, if we were talking about should Christian should Christians keep a Sabbath, 
I would say yes. But now we're talking about the Sabbath. So we're talking about, does it need to be on the last day of the week? And do I need to do no work? And do I need to? Well, that, that is, that is the Sabbath by definition. It's the seventh day, you know? So, um, but, uh, here's another One question. Minute. It, okay. Uh, man, what question do I want to ask? Okay. According to the fifth century church historians, Socrates, Scholasticus, and Sozomen, almost the entire Christian world outside of Rome and Alexandria still kept the Sabbath as late as the fifth century. Why do you think the Christians in Rome and Alexandria abandoned the Sabbath uh, early on while the rest of the Christian world still kept it? Hmm. I, I would actually argue there are many Christians today that keep it, particularly Messianic Jews. So sure. here's, here's how I would maybe describe that or maybe try to find a way into it. I'm kind of thinking as I'm talking here, but number one, if you're a Gentile, you've never been under the Sabbath. It's never been a requirement of you. So you would not feel any sort of obligation or affinity to the Jewish calendar as a Gentile believer in Jesus. Number two, if you are a Jewish believer in Jesus, you would feel no need to stop keeping Sabbath. Why not just continually keep it? So there's no nothing prohibiting it. And for Jew, for Gentile Christians, there's nothing requiring it. So that would kind of be my short answer to your question. Okay. So here is uh, uh the, we're we're at we're at the end here, unless you wanna <laughs> I, uh -oh. I, I, ju I just want to okay with Dr. Solberg. Like I said, you guys can All have right. your freedom, you know. Okay, Let's so yeah, j just one last um point, ju just because I'm interested to hear your take on this. Uh the scholar uh Bruce Metzer. He gives this explanation for why Christians in Rome and Alexandria abandoned the Sabbath while everyone else continued to keep it. Uh, I just, I'm just interested in your take. He says, quote, The difference between East and West in the observance of the Sabbath can be accounted for by a reasonable historical explanation. In the West, particularly after the Jewish rebellion under Hadrian, it became virtually important for those who were not Jews to avoid exposing themselves to suspicion, and the observance of the Sabbath was one of the most noticeable indications of Judaism. In the East, however, less opposition was shown to Jewish institutions. So this scholar offers... Um, you know, that explanation for why historically we know most of the Christian world still kept the Sabbath, while those Christians, particularly in Roman Alexandria, uh, abandoned it early on. What do you think of his take on that? Well, first of all, I really appreciate that he and I agree that the Sabbath is a Jewish institution, not given to Gentiles. Uh, and secondly, I, I, I guess I disagree with the generalization that the Sabbath was mostly kept. Uh, uh, my understanding in, this, in the reading that I've done about, and I've kind of only done deep studying up till the Council of Nicaea, but that the um, as the church became more and more Gentile, not only did the Gentiles not understand the Jewish world, but the Jewish Christians were kicked out of the synagogue. You might know about the Burkhat Hamanim, this benediction against mm -hmm. heretics. Mm -hmm. So the the Jewish Christians would be sitting in synagogue, and suddenly they're like, "I can't repeat that. That's that's you know blaspheming my my Lord Jesus." So they stopped going to synagogue as well. Um, and so, again, as I said, I, I believe the Gentiles weren't under Sabbath. And I think Christians largely understood that Sabbath was permitted but not required. And also, I think the Lord's Day played into it, too. But I don't know if we want to go down that road. Fair enough. You can ask me in the, the cross-exam if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All we'll right. Get around well, time and rules here. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I just don't want to work. So that's why I celebrate Sabbath. You know? <laughs> uh, but hey, uh, Rob, you're up, man. Go ahead. You have your liberty, my friend. Okay. I'm going to start off with a genuine open question uh, for you, David, because I think you might know the answer. And I'm studying it and, and don't know the answer. So in Exodus 20 and Deuter Deuteronomy 5, when we get the Sabbath commandment, right? It says, six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest. What occurred to me recently is that the seventh day work week, so to speak, didn't actually happen. We, the, the, the Jews got that from Babylon when they were in exile centuries after Sinai. And then the Romans, of course, took over that whole thing. But my question is this, the, the scripture doesn't explicitly say that the seventh day has to be a Saturday. It just says you work six days, the seventh day you rest. In the same way, you've got, hey, you, 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 um, plant your field and harvest for six years. And on the seventh year, you rest. So it's not really tied to a particular day. So I'm curious how, what you think that means. And if you know why those, that seventh day has gotten associated with the seventh day of the week, which is now a Saturday. Yeah. Well, um, 
I, I do cover this in my book. Um, uh, I have an FAQ section at the, at the end of my book where I briefly talk about this. But um, I, I'm of the opinion that Jesus kept the Sabbath on the right day. You know, he, sure. he, and so I, I think that it's pretty indisputable that, uh, that Jesus, he's God, you know, so he knows what day the Sabbath is. Um, and I, point, there's, yeah. yeah, so I, the, um, the Jew, he kept it on the same days, the, the Jewish people, obviously, which, uh, and, right. and many, and many Gentile Christians as well, as we know from, uh, Socrates, Scholasticus and Sozomen. Um, so the, uh, you know, we know that Christians, consistently throughout history have always kept the Sabbath on, uh, you know, Friday night to Saturday night. So, so that's just historically, I think it's pretty indisputable. I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but I just always go back to Je I always go back to Jesus. Jesus yeah, is uh, never go wrong there. Yeah. So, so grounded in G Yeah, that's great. Now I could push back a little bit and say, but Jesus, if the Sabbath wasn't picked on a date, you know, it wasn't, uh, anchored in a day of the week, it was just anchored in a six to one ratio, then the tradition could have just randomly chosen that day. Anyway, I digress. That was a little rabbit trail for fun. Okay. Let me ask you a better, better questions. Um, okay. So what, uh, what level of importance would you subscribe to observance of the Mosaic Shabbat for Christians today? So, so do you consider um, the Sabbath to be a secondary matter? You know, like, like, do you see it as something like uh, the debate between, let's say, infant baptism and, and believer's baptism, you know, where you've got two schools of thought that can disagree, but still consider each other faithful brothers and sisters in Christ? Is, is it kind of at that level? Or do you believe that that not observing Sabbath is a matter of living in sin? Uh, I definitely believe it's more important than baptism, because at least with that debate, uh, both sides agree that you should get baptized. So... Uh, mm -hmm. this is a little bit different, obviously, because you have one side that says, uh, it, it's optional at best, right? Uh, which I guess is your position. It's, it's optional. Um, and, uh, the, and so, and then of course you have, uh, my position, which is no Christian should keep the commandment to, to observe the Sabbath. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it is a sin to break any of the 10 commandments. You know, so I, I think that that that's the word is pretty clear about that. John three four defines sin as transgression of the law. Romans seven seven talks about uh, Paul defines right. sin as, well, as breaking the law. Actually, John three four describes sin as the trans as lawlessness, not as right. the breaking of the Mosaic law. Okay, well let's put that aside because uh, Romans uh, seven seven explicitly defines sin as uh, breaking the law, and Paul even uses one of the Ten Commandments as an example. Well, I don't think I don't think it I don't think a biblical case could be supported in saying that the breaking of the law of Moses is how we define sin. Now, it's certainly sinful for people under the law of Moses to break the law of Moses, but the law of Moses cannot be biblically supported as the definition of sin, breaking of, of that particular law. Otherwise, you'd have Adam and Eve sinless in the garden because they didn't break any of the laws of Moses. They were disobedient, they were lawless for mm -hmm. sure but they didn't break any of, of the Mosaic laws. So, so sin has to be much broader than the law of Moses. It has yeah, to I, be I, believe, I believe it's much, I mean, it, sure, it's much broader, but it's at least <laughs> transgressing expressed commandments uh, given by God. So yes, at, I'll, I'll at, least, that. Yeah. Yeah, at least, at least the, the 10 commandments. So. Well, okay. So let me, here's my next question. That's a perfect segue. Thank you for the setup. Um, what, in your opinion, is the reason, and I, I think I might know your answer now that we've talked, that all of the Ten Commandments are repeated and retaught in the New Testament, pretty much verbatim, except the Sabbath? I mean, why do you think the Sabbath is what is the exception there? Well, I, I would simply think you're, I, I would say that you're overstating uh, your, your case. I, I, I would say that the Sabbath is reinforced in the New Testament. Uh, well, first, I would say, that um, a commandment does not have to be explicitly repeated for it to be sure. uh, enforced, uh, reinforced. And I would say that the okay. New Testament um, uh, very clearly reinforces the Sabbath commandment for Christians in Matthew 5, uh, 17 through 20. Okay, let me make it a little more pointed then. Do you believe that the New Testament repeats the Mosaic 
requirements or regulations for Shabbat? I think it's assumed that based on the, the practice. It doesn't repeat it expressly? Uh, the Mosaic regulations. Well, yeah, yeah. Jesus, Jesus expressed, you know, clearly said, um, you know, I came not to do away with the law or abolish the law, but to fill it. Uh, he said, yeah, to that's, keep, not, keep, that's not about the Sabbath. I mean, I, he, I'm he, said to, he said to keep even, well, he's talking about the Old Testament scriptures and the Sabbath right, is a commandment of the Old the Testament scriptures. Keep the, keep the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, do no work. Yeah. Those are, those are the what, those, decide. So, so those would be at, at least among the least of the commandments, right? That Jesus okay, told so us to keep yeah, in so you Matthew see nineteen. It in there, but not expressly. Okay. So the next question then is: I mean, at le least even the least of the commandments seems pretty clear. I mean, I I, th I think yeah, uh, well, you know, until he fulfills it, and then he fulfilled it. So, well, fulfill, you know I mean? well, well, fulfill according to the context and according to um, respectable lexicons like BDAG in that context right. specifically means to. Um, show it forth. Well, I know what you mean. Yeah, I just want to yeah. jump. I want to get through these questions. Sorry. Um, okay. No problem. Yeah. So I mean, we're agreed then that you don't. You admit then that if there's no express repeating of the Mosaic commandment for the Sabbath. So my next question is, how did you come to the conclusion that all of the commands of Shabbat given in the Torah are still binding, with the exception of the death penalty? Do you did you see that overturned in Scripture somewhere? The death penalty overturned yeah do, do you see it overturned somewhere because the the torah requires death for desecrating the sabbath sure um no i, I think the sabbath is a commandment um worthy of death if you, if you break it in ancient israel that is governed by uh torah legislation okay so are we not under torah legislation now uh we do not live in a theocratic nation governed sure. that governed by a uh, torah so Right. It's, just, it's just the same as like, you know, the, the sacrificial laws. I mean, like when, when Israel was uh, in Babylon, they couldn't keep much of the Torah. Uh, they couldn't keep the sacrificial laws. They, they couldn't establish their own government uh, that is uh, governed by the Torah. So, um, you know, well, but that's, that's either that's, one of the one or two. I mean, it's the, the death penalty is applicable and you're saying it is. But well, do you, are you against the death penalty? Are you against the death penalty in principle? Only, oh well, no, not in principle. I mean, where it's okay. where it's appropriate. But yeah. I don't so what's so? It, so certainly. it's appropriate. So it's appropriate in the theocratic nation of Israel. That's where that's right. where the application the of that commandment. Right. That's where the uh, application of that commandment is applicable. Uh, right. so, so, so why why the rest of them are applicable, but not that one? I mean, it feels no because offense, they, can be, because they can be because they can be applied outside of the land of Israel. Is your position that we shouldn't keep commandments that we can apply? because there are some commandments that we can't no my position is that those commandments are no longer binding right okay because we're not under torah law we're not under a torah legislated nation well, well you're already not... you're already starting from that assumption then but but you're asking me how, how do i how do i reconcile this and i would well, say you, that okay, that, yeah. that, the, okay. that the law needs to be applied appropriately as you agree and the appropriate application of capital punishment laws is within a theocratic nation governed by the laws of Torah. But uh, the fact that we do not live in a theocratic nation does not do away with those laws, just like it didn't uh, when Israel was in Babylon, those laws weren't done away with. Um, and so, uh, and Israel was still expected to keep the laws that they could uh, keep, they, they could keep while they were in Babylon. And so right. my, my, his, my position is no different. We should keep the laws of the Sabbath that we can keep today. Technically, you could keep that if you esteem the law of God higher than the law of the United States. I, well, I realize I'm, I'm, I'm not. Point. Yeah, I mean, I'm not commanded to put anyone to death. Uh, I'm not a judge of theocratic Israel. Yeah. Who was who was commanded to put people to death? Who was commanded to pe put people to death? Yeah. In theocratic Israel, yeah. Who, who, who executed the death penalty? Well, I would say that the, the judges of the theocratic Israel made the rulings, and then there were various punishments that, that were carried out in different ways. Uh, you know, But uh, I would also say just, I, I mean, this may be a little bit more nuanced, so stop me if I'm getting off track here. But um, I don't think, I, I think that the, when the Torah gives the death penalty, it's giving the harshest penalty allowed, but that uh, lesser penalties were 
uh, could be given instead for for even for crimes that warranted the death penalty. We see this like in the law where it says like when a man's ox gores uh, kills a person, the man is, right. that you know he is has to be put to death, or he could pay a ransom for his life. You know, so there are sure. lesser penalties. Uh, we see that in the laws of adultery. Adultery requires the death penalty, but but Yahweh, when he divorces Israel in, in that uh, metaphoric um, way, you know he. Right. You know, he doesn't kill Israel. He doesn't put Israel to death. He he divorces her, which is a lesser but, penalty. Okay. And we, yeah, so. But so you don't see the you don't see those nuances. I, I'll call them as affirming the fact that the law of Moses was a national law for the nation of Israel, no, as opposed not, to. Not, not at all. That 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 would be a complete non sequitur. Just like I, I mean, all of the commandments, um, you know, are given as part of the uh, covenant, you know, made with with Israel at Sinai. You know, like there are a lot of okay. commandments that that we all that we all would agree still apply today that were not given until Israel was a nation in the land. So let me let me move on to my last question here. I've spoken to at least two Jewish rabbis and several Messianic Jewish friends. You know including one's a rabbi, one's a scholar. These are, you know, ethnically Jewish people who have come to faith in Jesus. Um, and they've all told me to a man that that Gentiles have never been a people of the covenant under the Sinai covenant, never expected to keep Shabbat, never expected to keep the feast like Passover. Um, do you agree with them? And if not, why do you disagree with them? Um, I do not agree that Gentiles, you know, should not keep the commandments because uh, the scriptures themselves explicitly uh, instruct them to. Uh, I, I like the the scholar I quoted earlier, uh, Will, William Willimon. He says that the, the Gentiles in Acts 15 are analogous to the strangers in the Hebrew scriptures and that they were expected to keep the, uh, the Torah um, as much of the Torah that applied to them. We, we know that not everyone that uh, was keeping the Torah, you know, um, in ancient Israel was an ethnic Israelite. You know, there were strangers that sojourned. Right. They were, them. They were uh, Englishmen in France keeping the laws of France. They were not given those laws, is my, is my point. I mean, we, we see... They, 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 weren't, wor they weren't worshiping Yahweh? They weren't worshiping Yahweh as strangers among the, the... Yeah, it's the same thing as obeying the laws of France when you live in France and eating a delicious croissant because you live in France. Uh, I'm not saying that they weren't. I, that's right? a weird they're analogy, not. but okay. <laughs> well, so many of them joined with the God of Israel and showed yeah. their loyalty to him and, and, God and kept, and beautiful, yeah, but and kept the commandments. Yeah. But it wasn't given to them. Uh, it was when they decided to join the Israel and no, obeyed and obey the God of Israel. Yeah. I it, mean, was, it was given to them when they decided to worship Yahweh. Guys, you got one minute like, left. Yeah, ju just like yeah. us, when we decide to follow God, we submit to His rules. Now, we we have di we have a, di a difference of opinion on what that entails, but when we decide to become Christians, when we decide to follow God by grace through faith, we are saved. But we then obey God's rules, and and so that it's the same thing. Yeah, but they, like, but that's a different. That's the allegiance. That's the willing allegiance. The the laws themselves were only for Israel. The so the, so the strain so the strangers that joined the people of God in the Old Testament they were not um they they were they did not have allegiance to Yahweh. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying they weren't part of the covenant. They were a separate class of people. But when they, the law, when they when they entered the law, but the law wasn't given for those nations. Like, look at this, Nehemiah. Oh, but when they decided to follow Yahweh, they they kept the Sabbath. Yeah, just like if you decide to live in France, you can you can obey those laws. Let me read you uh, Nehemiah nine. On the twenty fourth day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth. And you know this is the this is the rebuilding of, of Jerusalem, putting dust on their heads. Verse two: Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord for the quarter of the day. So my point here is that there is, even as, even as late as Nehemiah, there's still a very clear distinction between, I mean, why would, why would God call out sojourners and foreigners if they were exactly the same thing as Israelites? 
So when God made the the, the um, because is because <laughs> Israel is a the uh, there's there's a great podcast with Michael Heiser you got to listen to but the Israel is a theological construct not an ethnic construct it is not, the people not ancient Israel it's the people it's all right the sons of Abraham it, times Israel. up gentlemen times up all right. All right. <laughs> Fair I let you all go back just a little bit longer than what you're supposed to. I wanted that last question answered. So with this time right now, I just want to give you guys an opportunity. Do you want to do your closings for, first and then maybe do some questions and answers? Is that cool? Or do you want to do question and answers then closing? It's up to you guys. I'm good either uh, way. Either way? Let's go ahead and close and then we okay. can just go however long. Sounds good to me, guys. Go however uh, long. David? Yeah. I will start your five minutes uh, as soon as you start speaking, sir. Okay. All right. Well, once again, Rob, thank you for the dialogue. It was, uh, it was, uh, I learned a lot and uh, it was just a pleasure to speak with you. In my closing statement, I want to quickly summarize our discussion and what we've learned. If you'll recall, my contention was that the New Testament agrees with the Old Testament that Christians should keep the Sabbath. My opponent admits that Scripture nowhere explicitly overturns the keeping of the weekly Sabbath or states that it has come to an end. So Rob's position is that the Sabbath is no longer required. His position is, at best, only implied based on the arguments that he's made. But as we've seen, Rob's arguments are insufficient sufficient to overcome the overwhelming biblical testimony that not only implies the Sabbath's enduring validity, but also explicitly prescribes it. He did bring up uh, in, in the book of Hebrews, when I, I talked about Matthew 5.18, he thinks that Matthew 5.18 can't mean what it says because Hebrews says that some parts of the law have already passed away. But whenever, we've uh, but whenever we're confronted with an apparent contradiction in scripture, a good hermeneutical principle is to interpret difficult passages in light of clear passages passages. Matthew 5, 17 through 20 is straightforward. As J. Andrew Overman uh, says, New Testament scholar, quote, uh, it is Matthew uh, 5, 20, uh, 517 through 20 is, quote, unambiguous and does indeed command obedience to the whole Torah, end quote. Hebrews, on the other hand, contains elaborate midrashic arguments and metaphors. By far, Hebrews is the more difficult text to understand and therefore is more likely to be misunderstood. In light of the rest of the Bible, which affirms the validity of God's law, recent scholarship has revisited Hebrews on the topic of God's law. And what have they found? Well, according to Dr. Matthew Thiessen, he says, quote, there is simply no evidence in Hebrews that the author rejects the ritual and cultic aspects of the Jewish law, end quote. When we look at the book of Hebrews as a whole, we can see why scholars draw this conclusion. For instance, Hebrews 8 affirms Jeremiah 31, 33, which promises that God will write his law on our hearts in the new covenant. Also, Hebrews 8, 4 recognizes the legitimate ongoing role of the, little, the, the Levitical priesthood on earth. So these passages present a big problem for my opponent's interpretation. Um, my opponent said that, um, you know, the law is only for Jews. Okay, well, we've already demonstrated how that is false uh, in numerous ways. Um, the, the Sabbath is explicitly in the Ten Commandments given to the Israelite and the stranger as sojourns among them. Isaiah 56, uh, it, uh, Gentiles are explicitly admonished to keep the Sabbath. And throughout the New Testament, it is assumed that the Gentiles would keep the Sabbath in accordance with the law. The most natural interpretation is that they did this because they believed they should, not some ad hoc explanation that, okay, well, it was just tradition or they were doing this only to convert Jews, um, the most natural explanation is, as Rob said, to assume a, an expectation of continuity. Um, since scripture nowhere explicitly does away with the Sabbath, as Rob admits, I think Christians are perfectly reasonable to believe that it still applies based on the biblical evidence. As I said in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, we've seen that Jesus affirms the Sabbath by stating that he came to teach us how to keep the law properly. He said that the law remains valid until the end of the age, and he said to keep even the least of the commandments. As J. Andrew Overman writes, quote, I already quoted him earlier, but this passage is unambiguous and does indeed command obedience to the whole Torah. Uh, this is a clear affirmation of the Sabbath's 
ongoing validity as part of the law. In Matthew 12, as I said, Jesus taught what it means to keep the Sabbath in accordance with God's law, which is not what we would expect if he came to do away with it for Christians or came to make it not required for Christians. In Mark 2, Jesus said that God's purpose for the Sabbath from the beginning was to bless mankind with a day of rest. One minute. Numerous scholars recognize the statement as teaching the universal and permanent nature of the Sabbath commandment. Um, the apostles follow in Jesus' footsteps by continuing to keep the Sabbath throughout the New Testament, as I said. Indeed, much of the early church continued to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and the apostles by continuing to keep the Sabbath as late as the 5th century, according to 5th century church historians. So to say that these Christians kept Sabbath merely out of tradition, again, is ad hoc. Once again, based on scripture's explicit and repeated commandments to keep the Sabbath, the New Testament's affirmation of the law and the Sabbath's validity, and my opponent's failure to provide a good reason to reject the biblical commandment, Christians are perfectly reasonable to believe that the Sabbath still applies. At the end of the day, Christians who keep the Sabbath are in a win-win situation. If my opponent is right, we are simply doing something that is not required. However, he admits that it still benefits us. And uh, if I'm right, we are also honoring one of the Ten Commandments. So regardless of who you think won this debate, I would invite you to consider keeping the Sabbath because only blessing can come from it. Good. Nice. All right. So, uh, Rob, you're up with the final word of this debate before questions and answers. Well done, David. That was beautiful. Um, you've certainly challenged me. That's all, that's awesome. Uh, so wrapping up, what would I say? Um, Matthew... 17 Matthew 5 17 through 20 as we talked about it, it can't be interpreted on an island and so I think when we look at it in light of the more clear passage that we see in Hebrews 10 18 that says quote sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary close quote we can't deny that there's been a change in a dot and tittle of the law there is definitely a change and, and the way that we reconcile that then is not by trying to import something into Matthew 5 17 through 20 that teaches something that's not taught in the rest of the New Testament, which is the that the, that the Sabbath is required. Uh, there's nowhere, not in the Sermon on the Mount, not in the Lord's Prayer, not in the High Priestly Prayer, not in the Great Commission, not even in the Greatest Commandments, does Jesus even mention Sabbath. So you may want to import it into some of what he said prior to his resurrection uh, as part of the law as a whole, and I would certainly agree that it is part of the law as a whole, or it was part of the law as a whole, but it's certainly not sinful uh, under the new covenant, and it's certainly not worthy of the penalty of death had we the ability to mete out that particular punishment. Um, the covenant was explicitly between ethnic Israel and Yahweh, the, the people that he set aside for himself. Um, as scholar Carmen Imes, I just read that in this book that we, that we both read, she talked about how the phrase, my people, is only ever used by Yahweh to refer to ethnic Israel. It's never used of non-Jewish nations. Um, so I believe that scripture teaches that the keeping of the weekly Sabbath, the Mosaic regulations regarding the Sabbath is permitted, but not required of Christians. I agree with David that it's a, that it's a great, wise, spiritual discipline, that blessings can come from it. I wish I was better at it, but I certainly reject this idea that those who don't keep a Saturday Shabbat are walking in sin. I think that's unbiblical. And for those who do choose to keep the Torah commands, right, regarding Sabbath, if you choose that, I'm going to ask you to please not enforce the death penalty part. Leave, the, leave, leave that part aside. Um, the Sabbath and the new moons, um, they ceased and they were shadows. And Christ is the real thing. Paul's teaching about that's explicit. Jesus fulfilled those commands. And he, he didn't do away with them or abolish them. They weren't bad. Paul says the law is righteous and, and holy and good. But it was also temporary. Galatians 28, or great Galatians 3, 28 through 29 says that Jews and Gentiles are now, uh, are now of, uh, there's no difference between us. We're all one in Christ. And further, that the law was given until Christ came. It is Galatians 3, 24 and 25. The law was given until Christ came. Now that Christ has come, we're no longer, no longer under a law. I believe the Sabbath was given as part of the holiness laws to set Israel apart from the other nations. But now under Christ, there's no more Jew and Gentile. So no more need for holiness laws to set Israel apart from anyone, right? Jesus broke down that wall of hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles, Paul says in Ephesians 2. And what sets God people, God's people apart today 
is our love for one another and our faith in Christ. They'll know your mind by your love for, for one another, Jesus says. So we've got this whole idea of the holiness laws weren't done away with, they're not gone, but they're fulfilled differently under the new expression than they were under the mosaic expression. I also want to affirm that there is not a single thing we could do, no, no mosaic tradition, no holy effort that we could make that could add a single thing to what Christ has already done on our behalf. It's finished. Our salvation is complete. And those who have placed their faith in Jesus already have his righteousness in its fullness. So keeping the Sabbath is not some uh, issue. The Mosaic Sabbath is not an issue of sin and death. It's something that's a gift that we can enjoy for its blessings. Now, Jesus is One our minute. true rest. All right. Um, so I guess I'll wrap up in somewhat of an agreement with my uh, brilliant and handsome opponent. Is that what we wanted to call you? <laughs> um, that I would encourage Christians, though, I, I, despite all I've said, I would encourage all of us to set aside a day of the week, whichever day you choose, it doesn't need to be Saturday, to rest in God, to worship him, uh, to read his word, spend time with your family, not as a way to achieve righteousness, of course, or to, to try to live out some particular ritualistic thing, um, but as a matter of a, of a spiritual discipline, as a way to express your love for God and grow closer to him. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. And, uh, thanks, David. This has been awesome. I, I'm really grateful for our time together. Yeah, man. Guys, that, that's um, that's that's great. I mean, I've really enjoyed you guys going back and forth. It's been very edifying, I think. And and it shows. I mean, we've got a huge crowd tonight. And guys, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to get to all the questions. We're going to have to leave some on the cutting room floor. Um, I'm going to post them up here, let Tyler read them off. And uh, we'll start with a fun question for you, Rob. Yeah, I get fun questions, and David gets the tough ones. Well, I noticed this one, too, actually. So I wanted to ask you this as well, Rob, but did you ever serve uh, on active duty? No, you used word, copy that. When I was old enough to en enlist, I was too stupid to realize that that would have been a good thing to do. So, no, I did not. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, somebody said, since you said copy that. that, they said, since right. you said copy that, it's a U.S. military term, so they That's wanted military, to know. Lingo. <laughs> All if right. I'm not so, to use that as a citizen, I can stop using that phrase. Uh, we're going to go to the next question. Will be for David. So, question for David: Do you know if the Gentile nations that the apostles and early church reached out to were ever told to keep the Sabbath? Well, it, if we believe that the disciples carried out the Great Commission according to Jesus's commandment, then we can reasonably assume that they did. Uh, Jesus said uh, to make disciples of all the nations, teaching them everything that I commanded you. And of course, we know that that includes Sabbath observance. It includes Matthew 5, the uh, ongoing authority of the law, uh, which includes the Sabbath. It includes all of Jesus's teachings about what is lawful to do on the Sabbath and uh, his affirmation of the Sabbath's uh, permanent uh, validity in Mark chapter 2. So, and, and this this is borne out in church history, uh, as I said, and you know we see it all throughout the Book of Acts that that Gentiles and Jews were keeping the Sabbath together in the synagogues. Uh, we also see um, in church history, as I mentioned, I mentioned two fifth century church historians, Sozomen and Socrates Scholasticus, who say that almost all Christians outside of Alexandria and Rome continued to keep the Sabbath as late as the fifth century. And so I, I think that, um, yeah, I, I mean, according to the evidence, it, it seems pretty clear that they uh, carried out Jesus's great commission as he commanded and um, would have included that expectation of continuity. Uh, I, I really like how you put that, Rob, um, or a, an expectation of continuity um, with, uh, with regard to the Sabbath. So, David, I'm going to take host privilege here, and I'm going to ask you, since you're you're quoting church history a lot, and I don't have the quote right on me, but I know Ignatius actually said that they were actually getting... I, I lost you. Yeah, yeah, you're muted, bub. No, I lost I you. It, there, you're back. I can't no. hear him. Nope. You're not back. It looks like you're muted. So right, much for yeah. most privilege. So, yes. God was like, nope, not today, David. <laughs> <laughs> if are are you talking about Ignatius, uh, the Magnesians, the letter to the Magnesians? 
Ignatius's letter to the Magnesians. Looks is like that what you're talking yes. about? I have, I have an interesting early church history thing to mention. If you're familiar with the Didache, which I think you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, that was very early. So right, can you all hear me now? History. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I was going to ask you real quick. Um, Ignatius to... talked about uh, uh, getting away from the uh, Jewish traditions and stuff like that. So, I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, there is a lot. Because I think uh, we at... could... And the reason I ask that is because yeah. I think there, you, you instead of saying it's like one sided that they kept the Sabbath, you can right. see that there's definitely oh, ones oh, that yeah. didn't and ones that didn't. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I completely okay. completely agree with that. Uh, with get my book, honestly, I have a whole uh, yeah, section. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, I have a whole section on that uh, Ignatius passage, and also the Didache that Rob mentioned. I have a whole section on that, on, on that yeah. that passage as well. So, uh, so but the but yeah, the, mention the Sabbath. It mentions well the. the, the it well, it's it, according to scholars, it's ambiguous because in the Greek it does not explicitly say Lord's Day. But but in any case, uh, even if it did say Lord's Day, it's still ambiguous because um, we can't just assume that he means Sunday. Yeah, um, I think it's you know, clear in the Didache that the Lord's Day referred to the first day of the week. Okay, we you see can that expression in Revelation one ten. John even uses that same phrase. I'm you know, we scholars assume it to mean the same thing. And many date this Didache to the late first century, which would have been contemporaneous with uh, with uh, the Book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's anyway. definitely interesting uh, going back to church history and kind of looking at some of the things. The whole <clears throat> issue with Polycarp and Easter, and you know, instead of uh, having uh, uniformity, they they'd rather have uh, unity. You know what I mean? So yeah. instead right. of yeah. uniformity, they had unity and they shared the Lord's Supper and disagreed. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> yeah, well, right. but, but yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it, I I would challenge Rob and, and uh, shameless plug, but my book might be a good place to start. I, I yeah, um, I would. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah, definitely I, um, look into I that. I cite I cite numerous scholars uh, on uh, who who would challenge you on that, uh, and they um they actually say that it, that it is ambiguous, and it might even refer to the Sabbath day. Uh, land, uh, for instance, one scholar cites the Acts of John, which is a uh, late second century, which references the Sabbath as the Lord's Day. And uh, the scholar Aaron uh, Milovec writes that, quote, given, the, the Jewish given that the Jewish calendar dominates the Didache, the divinely instituted day could refer either to the Sabbath or the first day of the week. I, <laughs> well, I have no problem, by the way. If gets, though. I mean, it's, it's like a manual for churches. It's right. very interesting that they wouldn't express, explicitly come out and say, keep the Sabbath. Yeah. Uh, well, we got to like, move on, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I know I started us on a whole other rabbit trail. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But this question is for you, Rob. Okay. Asking for Go someone ahead, Tyler, else. read it. Yeah. If Christians don't have to observe the Sabbath, are they free to disregard the Ten Commandments? Um, we are not free to break the law of God. The other nine commandments are retaught, reinforced, and some, in many cases, verbatim in the New Testament. So nothing changed. When I say that the Mosaic expression is different than the new expression of the law of God, uh, they're overwhelmingly similar. Nothing changed in terms of what's right and wrong. Nothing termed in, changed in terms of loving God and loving people. Just some of the expressions changed in, in terms of especially the holiness law. So, yeah, obeying the Ten Commandments, and I would even go so far as agreeing with David, Keep all Ten Commandments. You'll never go wrong with that. Uh, are you required to? Obviously, all the other ones you are, because all the other ones are mentioned in the New Testament. The Sabbath isn't retaught, repeated in the New Testament. Uh, let me, hold on. Let me add that. The Mosaic regulations about the Sabbath are not retaught or, you know, promoted or any of that in the New Testament. You know, real, I just want to, if I can, for just a second to, and, and I apologize in advance if I missed this kind of running back and forth, uh, doing other things, but did either of you guys bring up Matthew 12, 12 during this discussion? I didn't hear it, but if you did, I'll just go back and re-listen to it. I don't think so. Okay. So let me read it for our audience real quick. Jesus is speaking in just Matthew 12, 12 says, of how much more valuable is a man than a sheep. So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath, mm -hmm. or it is permissible to do good mm -hmm. on the Sabbath, right? And so given that that is, to me anyway, one of the explicit active commands of Jesus, hey, this is what you're to do on the Sabbath. It's permissible to do good. My question is, and this is for both of you, 
is it possible that Jesus could have left that ambiguous, given that there is a sense of Christian liberty whenever it comes to Christianity? Does that make sense? Mm, interesting, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's a good question, because Jesus' ministry and interactions were overwhelmingly with the Jewish people, who would have been under the law and, and keeping Shabbat, and certainly, I think, keeping it for much longer than after his ministry. So there's there's a there's an aspect of that at, that I see where Jesus is saying, look, here are the real ways, the proper ways to uh, keep up the Sabbath, which I think, you know, goes to support um, what David's opinion that it's sort of an assumed that the Sabbath will be kept. And, and so I don't deny that. What I would say, though, is that the Sabbath is, as I mentioned, permitted but not required. So for those who are keeping Shabbat, then Jesus is clarifying some of those things for his Jewish brethren. But I'm not sure what he would have had in mind. I'll have to think about that, what he would have had in mind in the bigger picture when they took the gospel to the other nations and, and the Gentiles were now included. Okay. David, did you want to get in on that as well? Um, I, I mean, I would just say it, it's what um, it's a, similar to what Isaiah says. Isaiah connects Sabbath observance to pursuing justice and righteousness. Uh, I think it, I think it actually is in Isaiah 56. Um, okay. Yeah, it says, keep justice, do righteousness for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. So it seems that Isaiah connects justice and righteousness uh, with Sabbath observance. So I, I really see Jesus. I, I believe Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. I believe that he was the one who gave the Sabbath originally. Um, so I, I believe that he has the ultimate authority to determine what true Sabbath observance is. But I also see a lot of continuity with uh, the Old Testament prophets in regard to the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus corrected a lot of the bad doctrine concerning the Sabbath. Right. And uh, he brought he he returned the Sabbath to its true purpose uh, in in accordance with God's will. But yeah, doing doing good on the Sabbath, yeah, it, we can't go wrong. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right on. Yeah, I think yeah, we're allowed to do good on any day, actually. Well, all yeah, right. Yeah. Well, here here you go. Here, uh, next question. All right, question for David: Is the Sabbath symbolic or a type of anything future of Mount Sinai? Are the other commandments, perhaps the Sabbath is different, even though listed in the 10th commandment. So is the Sabbath symbolic or a type of anything future? I think so. I think it's a, I think it's a picture of the, the messianic era, the, the new creation, uh, which is already, but not yet. Right. You know, you, you're familiar with that concept. Uh, the new covenant has been inaugurated. The new creation has been inaugurated, but we're still, uh, anticipating the uh, it to arrive in fullness. And I believe the Sabbath is a picture of that ultimate peace and rest and joy that awaits that awaits us in the future. And in fact, I think the Sabbath uh, resting on the seventh day is sort of a way to get a glimpse of that even right now in our present reality, while we're still in the not yet, while we're still in the waiting for, for the uh, new creation where we will experience that joy and fullness, we get a glimpse of it. We get a taste of it every Sabbath that, that, we, uh, that we choose to uh, lay our burdens down, right, and, and, um, and rest uh, on that day. So, yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, this one's for both of you guys. So this And it's kind of a fun one. So, you yeah. know, think about it real quick and uh, let me know. <laughs> All right, question for both Rob and David. What is the best argument you've heard from the opposing side? And I think she means tonight. Like, what uh -huh. have right. of you brought okay. to the table tonight that's the best? Um, but, yeah. That is a good, good question. Let me think of my favorite thing David said. My favorite thing Rob said was when he called me brilliant and handsome. <laughs> I think I think that was his best argument. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I have no proof for it. It's just an opinion. <laughs> um, That's funny. Yeah, you want to go first, Rob? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, the thing that the thing that I think is maybe the strongest argument from your side in general is the idea that um, that Jesus taught what's appropriate on the Sabbath. 
And so the mm -hmm. assumption, it's an, it's a reasonable assumption to say, well, if he's teaching what's appropriate on the Sabbath, it still matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I think, uh, probably, um, the biggest challenge, I don't really know if you've explicitly, you, you've kind of alluded to it, but, um, the, uh, I, I think probably the biggest challenge is like within Hebrews, there seems, you know, there are some difficult passages, uh, that, that pronomian Christians, uh, need to be able to explain and, and, um, you know, they're, they're pretty challenging and, and take a lot, uh, it's a lot to unravel. Um, but you know, it, it's all wrapped up in, you know, the new covenant and what, what is passing away and, and all of that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, um, that, that's really an objection, uh, your objection to my interpretation of Matthew five eighteen, um, which I see as being, you know, unambiguously affirming the validity of the law until the end of the age. And, and you, you cite Hebrews of course, and say, well, Hebrews seems to say that things have already passed away. And so, um, yeah, pronomian Christians like, like me, we have to know how to, how to reconcile that. I, I think as I said, I, well, I'm not going to, uh, you know, <laughs> address the argument again here just cause yeah. it's not the, but, but yeah, that, that's, that's a, um, yeah, that's, that's a strong argument. All right. Next one right uh, on. for David. Yep. What is your interpretation of Romans 9, 30 through 33, where Paul says the Gentiles have obtained a status of righteousness before God without the law? Well, I think we, none of us are uh, righteous with the law. I mean, none of us can keep the law uh, perfectly. We're, we're declared righteous by, by uh, Messiah's blood alone. You know, we, we're, uh, we're, we we obtain righteousness through uh, the work of Christ and uh, Him imputing His righteousness um, upon us, and so I think that uh, that that's basically it. You know, I I think that we don't we don't keep God's laws to become righteous. You know, we we keep it because we are righteous. We we keep His standards. There's differences of opinion on on what that means, but Rob would would, would agree that we keep God's commandments. Um, uh, you know, because we're righteous, because we've made right, uh, we've been made righteous by Christ. And, and so we, we do that as an expression of our love and obedience to him. Does that make sense? Also, I, don't, I don't know yeah, if I answered that. Right. I think we also keep it so we don't get killed. I'm just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the, death right. uh, yeah. <laughs> the death penalty. I, I All right. I love. Okay. <laughs> Next question. This is uh, for both you guys. Yep. Is it logical to believe that the apostles were sending newly converted Gentiles to the synagogues to be taught by those who rejected Jesus? Hmm. Interesting question. Is it logical to believe that the apostles were sending newly converted Gentiles to the synagogues to be taught by those who rejected Jesus? Yeah, well, I, I think they're... Like... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, David. I mean, I, I think that they were sending them to Messianic synagogues. I think that there were, uh, you know, the, you know, there were, um, uh, a, a lot, there were synagogues that, uh, you know, James talks about, um, you know, you, you know, when someone comes into your assembly, right. And, uh, that word there for assembly is the Greek word synagogue translated everywhere in, in James two, everywhere else in the new Testament, it's translated as synagogue. And so, uh, James is writing to believers whose meetings took place in what was called a synagogue. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think that, um, number one, I would, I would say that, you know, that, uh, that, uh, you know, the, uh, there were such things as, as messianic synagogues. I'd also say that, um, you know, I, that that was where the Gentiles could read the Torah. I, I think it is logical because the scriptures were accessible in the synagogues. Like that's where the scriptures were uh, accessible. And so for the Gentiles to be discipled in the scriptures, to learn God's word and all of that, uh, the synagogue is a logical place for, for them to go. Uh, and we know that there were Christians and non-believing Jews who attended synagogue as well. Yeah, I think it changed over time. So you've got the initial Acts phase, you know, where you've got Paul going into the synagogues every Sabbath to teach about Jesus. 
Um, and so there is definitely a, a period of time before what the scholars call the parting of the ways in which mm -hmm. things were kind of mixed up. You know what I mean? Yeah. They were kind of overlapping, but there was definitely a line that began within the first few decades of Christ that Jesus was the stumbling block, that mm -hmm. there were synagogues that would reject him. And that's mm -hmm. where we get the, the you know, the Benedict, uh, benediction against heresies. And then you've got other synagogues which morphed into Messianic Jewish places. And so at the same time you've got that going on, we've got starting as early as the, in the 60s, you've got now the apostles' letters and other extra biblical things being distributed. So for the rest of the first century, as this kind of parting of the ways is taking place, you're, you're having more and more scripture, including the epistles of Paul, the gospels and that sort of thing, as they were written and began to be copied and distributed. And so it becomes a little bit of a mixing pot. And I think that's why it's such mm -hmm. an interesting historical area era. But I think mm -hmm. I, I see the question, the, the thought behind the question, I'm assuming is Acts 15, 21, where you know, it's it's presumed that the, the Gentiles would go to the synagogues or he's taken that assumption. Um, would they go there? Would the apostles willingly send them to a synagogue that rejects Christ? Certainly not. They wouldn't do that. But like, I think I agree with David, there were certainly, at least for a while, messianic congregations. Mm -hmm. Right on. All right. Question for both Rob and David. How do believers know for certain which commandments in the Torah of Moses apply to them in the New Covenant? You want to take that, Rob? Or do you want me to go? You can go first. Okay. Um, Beauty before the age. <laughs> <laughs> you are a handsome man, David. Just so. um, yeah, I, I think just to study them. I mean, a uh, new Testament is a great indicator, uh, of what, what, you know, was applied, but, but I think that the, um, I think my assumption, uh, is that, um, when Jeremiah, when Jeremiah talks about the new covenant, one of the promises of the new covenant seems to me to affirm the ongoing validity of the entire law. And I quoted several, a, a couple scholars that seem to suggest that as well, that no Jew ever imagined that Jeremiah talked about anything other than the law of Moses when he said that in the new covenant, God was going to write the Torah on his people's hearts. And so I think that um, all the Torah, uh, ideally, you know, um, uh, every commandment that, uh, you know, applies to us, um, you know, there, there are certain commandments for certain types of people, like commandments specifically for priests, commandments specifically for judges, commandments specifically for women, um, and, and so on and so forth. And so it, it's just a matter of uh, finding out what can be kept, you know, what applies to you as an individual and um, walking that out. So yeah. right on. And this is the final one because, you know, I've kept you guys way longer. This is, you, this does is Rob want to do, does he want to oh, take that oh, yeah. real quick or. Okay. Yeah, ahead, I'll, I'll just, take a, I'll just take a quick shot at that. So Jeremiah 31, we're talking about, <coughs> he had no concept that when he wrote the Torah will be written in their hearts, that it would not include what he knew. I would agree with that because it hadn't been revealed yet. So prophets only really know things when it's revealed in a vision or it's phenomenological, right? They can only write from the world they know. So he had no concept of Christ and, and what the new covenant would look like and what that even meant. Uh, so I think that's that's not really a strong <laughs> argument against it. But what I would say about this is how do we know? I would agree with you that it, that we have to bear ourselves in scripture. We need to become scripturally literate. And I would even agree with David. I think you like my phrase about the assumption of continuity. I think that's a good way to look at it because the law of God God doesn't change. His law doesn't change. His holiness doesn't change. He expresses it differently. So if we begin with the assumption of continuity and then look into the New Testament to see, is there something specific that happened? If not, we can. it's more safe to assume it's still in effect. But when we have things like Colossians 2, 16 and 17, which say, don't let anyone judge you about the Sabbaths, we know something's changed. That's our, that's our alert that something came up. So I would say, I would say that's kind of how I would approach it. All right, now for the final question, because I've kept you guys way too long. But guys, honestly, if you want to get in touch with these guys, there's ways to go about that. Um, and I'm going to let them give you that information 
after this last question so they can plug their websites, plug how to contact them or whatever, you know, as with questions or, or anything like that. Or if you want to know things like David said, get my book. <laughs> you yep. know? So, yeah. Um, but yeah. So this is the last question and it is going to be directed for Rob. So, Rob, if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What promise and to whom? I see that as relating to the Abrahamic promises. Mm -hmm. Which which were made to the descendants of Abraham in, in Genesis 12, 3. It talks about, you know, he was going to be a blessing to all the nations. Right. That's my that's my first answer now i want to think about it a little bit but let's leave it out there okay <laughs> all right Fair well enough. uh guys this has been incredible i think that you, you know you guys like yes thanks for coming on thanks for doing this uh we went over i mean we're at almost two hours and 15 minutes it feels like it's just been like an hour <laughs> you know i mean it's been i mean you guys <laughs> yeah hit on all uh, cylinders man for me yeah. So, um, again, David, why don't you just tell us about websites and books and stuff and where we can find you? Yeah, sure. Thank you guys for, for hosting me and Rob. Uh, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so I learned a lot and, and really had a, a great time dialoguing with Rob. And, um, and so I, I wish you guys success as you launch your new ministry, your new podcast, um, looking, looking forward to you having Bill mounts on your program, who is a giant man. That guy is, uh, that guy's awesome. So looking forward to seeing more episodes anyway. Um, so you can check me out at, uh, davidwilber.com and, um, you, you can see the spelling on uh, my name right there. Uh, it's E R, not U R. So I'm not related to Paul Wilbur. I get asked that every messianic event I ever attend. Um, so, um, but yeah, I am uh, DavidWilbur.com. You can find all of my articles and everything. You can find all the information about my books and um, and all of that there. So hope to hope to connect with you. Right on. right on thanks man uh and again i'm enjoying the exodus series that you're in collaboration with with your brother-in-law oh that's not me that's not you no that's not me no that's not you oh i'm sorry yeah. Did, was it is that the one with the you the what the will the wilbur with the you <laughs> no it, it's uh it's some other scholar um, Oh, is it wow. yeah yeah i uh the i helped with the enoch uh oh that's the one made. i was talking about <laughs> oh you I said you exodus. said I met, yeah i did i did i met enoch because i i saw the uh i actually heard you preaching on enoch before and that's where it got me the link um but yeah man i yeah i enjoyed the enoch one immensely immensely um i did because i did like I did a blog on it years back. I, you know, like I said, I'm 40. I've been in this for a while. So I, you know, I did, uh, I did a, a series on Enoch in the past because I was dealing with it. And sure enough, like then I saw your stuff later on. It's just like helped confirm a lot of the things that, that I was, you know, thinking about it in the past too. But, uh, uh, Dr. Solberg, uh, go ahead. If you can tell people where to find you again, thank you for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been an honor to hang out with you guys. I'll make it simple and fast, rlsolberg.com. You can find my books there. You can get to my YouTube channel there and read my articles and just have a really great time. So, <laughs> Right on. Gentlemen, right on. I really appreciate you coming in. I've gotten Rob's book, Tourism. I highly recommend it to anyone. David, I'm going to get your book um, as well and probably highly recommend it to everyone as well. But now, guys, thank you so much for doing this to our listeners. Thank you for hanging out with us for two hours, man. This has been fun. I've been excited. Yeah. I really want to. David, you've got to come back on our channel. Man, I've got so many things to talk to you about just after <laughs> listening to this. So uh, Romans 7, 5, you know, the yeah. law arousing sin and just different things like that. Like, I want to talk to you about those things. But, but gentlemen, it's been an absolute honor to host both of you, and both of you guys are, are welcome back anytime. Anytime. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks, hey, everyone. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to see more content like this, I want to invite you to subscribe to my channel.
Also, don't forget to hit that little bell so that you'll be notified when new videos like this are released. One last thing, be sure to connect with me on my website, davidwilber.com. There you can find a ton of free resources like articles and videos. You can learn more about the books that I've written. Also, if God has put it on your heart, there is an opportunity to throw a couple bucks my way to support my work. Again, thanks for watching this video and I'll see you next time.